we're going to get through this video as best we can. There's a lot to cover. And in a way, this video is going to be an introduction and a precursor to a lot of future videos that are going to be using this video, a lot of the subjects of this video as a reference. And even a lot of the videos I've been making up to this point where a lot of people might not understand what I'm talking about. This will really help in understanding what I'm talking about. Um, this video is called Circuitry and Beyond because we're not just talking about the circuitry of human design. We're also going to be talking about uh, things that are related to the circuitry, things that we can see throughout history, things that we can see within human beingness, human psychology, um, and things like that, philosophy. Uh, and the thing about circuitry is that its basis is around all these centers that you see. Now, that could be a whole other video. And there are people out there who uh, do classes on looking at just centers. And I recommend going and finding a teacher that you like or somebody that knows their stuff and really getting into the centers. And I might do a video later looking at centers. But in our moving through this subject of circuitry, we will be discussing centers quite a bit in one way or another. But the reason I like to start with circuitry is that circuitry is the glue that holds these centers together, that allows communication to take place between these centers, and uh, it shows how these centers relate to one another. For example, you can see how the ajna, it's not connected to the, all this motion within the body. It's not connected to any of the motors being the heart center, the sacral, the root, or the solar plexus. Anywhere where the life is really lived and fully experienced, the ajna center doesn't have a connection to it, not a direct connection. It has to use the throat as a relay center. So, you know, that's one interesting thing we could look at, how the mind should, shouldn't be the thing running your life if you're because that will lead to a lot of suffering if the mind is trying to control all of this the inner workings of the body graph now this has been a subject for a long time that people have touched on the mind is really the issue we have very exaggerated minds in our separated consciousness and you know our whole body works in union but for some reason our mind can just wander off with its own agendas and it does this so habitually that it gives us a lot of operant conditioning in the feelings of separateness and the sensations of separateness which then leads to beliefs of separateness and whole lifestyles based on separateness um, and being feeling disconnected right in the same way the ajna is disconnected from the life there's a lot of anxiety that is you know when you learn about the centers you will find that the Ajna is uh, connected to certain anxieties that we have. But you'll notice that all these centers have numbers in them, and all these numbers correspond to hexagrams of the I Ching. And the I Ching, this ancient system that's about 5,000 years old from China, when Ra got this knowledge, it's, it's a combination of the I Ching and Western astrology. And with the body graph, that brings in a, combi a further combination of the Kabbalah and the Indian chakra system. So these four systems kind of come together into a very comprehensive whole. But they're very different from the systems that have come before them, even though there, there are certain similarities. As you can see, around the whole zodiac wheel, we have all 64 of the hexagrams. And each of these correspond to a certain area within the body graph. Now there's interesting geometries having to do with the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching that Nassim Harriman discovered. He found that when you take the first hexagram, which is primary yang, which has all solid yang lines or masculine lines, and you take the second hexagram, which is all broken or yin lines, feminine lines, when you take these two hexagrams and put them together, they can only make one shape. There's only one three-dimensional shape that those 
lines can make, and that's a star tetrahedron or a double tetrahedron. And Nassim also said that uh, if you took all the hexagrams, all 64 hexagrams, you would end up creating the 64 tetrahedron grid, which of course is the basis of the flower of life pattern. Now, this is the basic geometry of division and how life, how life expands it, within a, a kind of harmony of a union of masculine and feminine. It's basically how genetics works. Nassim Harriman also has, has shown this. When you have cell division after conception, they, the cells do divide into this star tetrahedron shape. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So we have the body graph. And each of the planets that are around the zodiac wheel correspond to one of these uh, hexagrams. So if you look at your natal chart, say you have a planet in the center of Leo, that would correspond to the seventh hexagram. And there's many hexagrams in Leo and all the other signs. So when you fill all this in, you might get a body graph that looks like this. And you have two calculations, the personality and the design. The personality is the calculation that took place right when you were born. Those are all the placements in black, where all the planets were right when you were born. But that also creates another calculation of 88 degrees, exactly 88 degrees before you were born. Those are all the red placements, called the design placements. The personality placements are all very conscious aspects of yourself, and the design placements are aspects of yourself that are not so conscious. They are very much having to do with your body and things that are already in motion, things that you don't necessarily consciously engage all the time, but that are very much there, and that I've noticed other people will notice about you more than you notice about yourself. You know, like for example with the design Sun Earth, with this chart we're looking at, the 9.3 and the 16.3, other people will notice those proclivities about this person more than that person will notice them about themselves, but they are very still very much there. And it's wise to become aware of these design placements and their, uh, their activity in your life. Or, you know, you might have a chart that looks like this chart. Actually, this chart right here is my chart. And I like to put this body graph up here, my body graph, so that you can get a context of why I am the way I am and how I do things. Uh, there's a few books that I, I would recommend in learning human design that I'll put in the, um, the description. And some interesting web pages that you can go look at and learning about crosses. I even deal a little bit with crosses on my website, but using different systems. So with all these placements that I have or that you have or that anybody has, you have to look at all of them as working together. When you separate too much and you generalize too much about just one aspect, it's not really describing you that much. Um, it's just like with astrology, like if, if it depends on what planets you have in the 12th house. It just depends. You can read about 12th house meanings, for example, but that doesn't mean that they all apply to you in just one way. It depends on what planet is in that house. It depends on how those planets are aspected. It depends on a lot of things. It, it's all working together perfectly. It's the same thing with human design. All of these placements are working together. And if I just read, say, uh, something about the 214, and say, for example, in the definitive human design book, if I read that book about like the 214 or the 1057, and it said, these people are like this, you have this channel, which means you're like that. You got to be careful when you read that stuff. A lot of it is generally true, but you also have to take into account that there's many other things going on with your body graph. And when you start to learn all these things, you got to synthesize yourself. Because the system is so huge that you, you'll never find a book out there that can synthesize all of this for you. Like, gee, what would, what, what would it be like for someone to have a 1057 who's also a generator, who also has the cross of the Sphinx, who also has the... P L L D L R variable, who also has this, who's also a 3 5 profile, who also has, you know, all these things. This is something you have to do on your own. This is something that can take years 
of distillation, but it can be fun. It's not like totally arduous, even though you might come up to uh, points of transformation in your life that can seem arduous and that may be arduous and difficult. But human design really helps at uh, showing what's there to work with. And the synthesis that takes place is something that you have to bring. It's something that no book can give you, no reading from somebody can give you. I can point out a lot and point out certain things, but you're the one who's ultimately living this. In, in, in essence, you know more about this than I do because you're the one who's living it all the time, right? So just be careful in uh, taking absolutes about certain placements. If you take in too many of the absolutes, uh, you're kind of putting yourself in a narrow little box and you're not going to be able to crawl out of this box if you take things way too literally about each and every one of these placements and configurations. So it all works together. It all sort of condenses into a point and that point radiates direction in life. It can show you the true north, the true north, the direction that you're already headed in, which helps you do a lot of things like getting rid of resistance in your life. Now, resistance is a real big deal. In the Letters from 500 series, a big thing is getting rid of resistance and noticing resistance and even understanding resistance when you feel like you can't get rid of it. It doesn't have to ruin your life and you don't have to focus on resistance in ways that only create more resistance. It's okay to notice it and to uh, be aware of it and there's certain uh, exercises in those books that help with uh, transmutation and, and getting out of uh, certain kinds of resistance in order to help you get more to true north, right? And again, Letters from 500. I've been doing videos about its connection to uh, human design. And there is very much a very deep connection between human design and Letters from 500. Uh, for one thing I'll just mention is that Ra got the knowledge in 1987. He taught it for over 20 years and died in 2010. What I find fascinating is that in Letters from 500, uh, the future race that human design also predicts, the future race counts 2010 as year zero for them. So Ra dies in 2010. They see 2010 as year zero, the future race does. Now, why would they do that? Well, it's interesting that Ra was given the title Uruhu by the voice that gave him this knowledge. Uruhu means door closer. Door closer. He's closing the door on a certain era. He's helping close it anyway. You could say we're still in the process of transition right now. We're kind of like bridge builders from one state, one place to another place. Now, Ra, in, in closing that door... He gave us a lot of gifts, and Ra was a very left-oriented person. It's all about moving from leftness to rightness in human design. We've been living in a left-oriented world, a very strategic-oriented world. You could say a very narrow world. And we're moving into a right one, which is very peripheral, very open, very feeling. And it's the same thing when you read uh, Letters from 500, you know, and I just find it fascinating that... Ra, how many first lines he had, how many individual channels he had. That, that's all he had, individual channels and integration channels. And very splenic person, very individual, a manifester, all these first lines, a 5-1 profile. He, 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 he kind of encapsulated the left-oriented world that we've been in for many thousands of years. He kind of encapsulated it. And he became a vessel for this knowledge in order to close the door and what happens after a door closing? Well, there's lots of opportunity, like Ra would talk about. There's lots of opportunity to move forward in many different kinds of ways. None of this stuff is written in stone about how things are going to happen. Even though, you know, th there are certain energies that need to play themselves out. Uh, and we, we might be able to divine how a lot of that may play itself out. So, in human design, we have these three circuit groups. We have the collective circuit group, the individual circuit group, and the tribal circuit group. Each of these circuit groups has two subgroups. When we look at the collective circuit group, it has two 
subcircuits of the logic and understanding circuit and the abstract and sensing circuit. The individual circuit group has two subcircuits of the knowing circuit and the centering circuit. And we also have an integration channel, which is very much connected to individual circuitry, and we'll get to that later. And the tribal circuit group, which has the two sub-circuits of the defense circuit and the ego circuit. But we're going to start with the collective circuit group. Now, one thing you'll notice about the collective circuit group is that it does touch all the, of the centers, except the heart center. There's a reason the collective circuit group does not touch the heart center, which we'll get into in a little bit here. You also notice that the logical and understanding circuit is centered around the spleen, and that the abstract and sensing circuit is centered around the solar plexus. So keep this in mind the further we move along here. The collective circuit group as a whole has certain keynotes, which are basically sharing or collective dumping, where if you have certain collective uh, channels, you may be quote-unquote dumping them within the collective without being so conscious of the fact that this is something within you that just needs to be done. It's like other people always need to be involved in one way or another. Even if you're by yourself, there is something within these channels that wants to share the energy, to get other people involved in the energy in one way or another. Now, the collective does not touch the heart center meaning it has no will and no ability to make proper deals with a true tribal or individual understanding of things. Hence the collective is relegated to sharing only. Whenever it is assumed the collective has, quote, a will, i.e. the quote-unquote will of the people. Have you ever heard that? Only tyranny can occur when it is, when it is assumed the collective has a will like this as if there's a, a will of the people. The will of the individual or the tribe cannot be imposed on the collective without serious repercussions, as in the case with both science and religion, which is leftness and rightness. Impersonal generalities being judgments, what seems to work for most people, what doesn't seem to work for most people. It also has to do with what it takes to run a tight ship, by ensuring a future logical understanding circuit and codifying and making sense of the past, which is the abstract and sensing circuit. So, let's look closer at logic first, how logic circuitry operates. Keynotes of the logic and understanding circuit are ensuring a better future through experimentation finding the right patterns that work and sharing them, making things foolproof. Scientific and technological advancement. It is existentially in the now. Practicing a single pattern over and over until eventual mastery and perfection. Hence, also apprenticeship and leadership. Stopping to concentrate or inquire, quote, why. It is the judgment of current patterns, focusing on one thing at a time, contrary to the abstract and sensing circuit that takes everything in experientially and peripherally, only to make sense of things later. It has to do with creating the right time and circumstances as opposed to being at the mercy of them and strategic survival-based thinking and behavior, quote-unquote fear-based knowledge. As you can see, the spleen is on the far left, and this is one of three awareness centers within the body graph, the three awareness centers being the spleen, the ajna, and the solar plexus. And there is an evolution taking place, like I said, from leftness to rightness. What's left in terms of logical circuitry is not in uh, a very easy communication with what's right and especially in our world even though that's changing more and more scientists are getting what we call spiritual 
or peripheral with their knowledge, even though they're very much still using science, they're leaving things open-ended. And they're looking into different kinds of things that have been very taboo for a while. So we have this evolution from leftness to rightness. And we've been in a very left-oriented world for, for a very long time. Um, very strategic, very future-oriented, very scientific and technologically advanced. Now, some people might think that, uh, well, we haven't been very technologically advanced for a long time, but we have had the roots of that technological advancement. It's just that as soon as it was sparked with the Industrial Revolution and, and certain other things, as soon as the spark hit, it caught like wildfire, and we're still trying to catch up to that. And it's actually propelling us into a different kind of awareness, which is, again, right-oriented, solar plexus-oriented, very peripheral. So, let's look at what that abstract sensing circuit that's centered around the solar plexus has to do with. It has to do with what's experiential the need for experience and moving through the key word being through you ever heard of the expression the way out is through nothing sums up the times we're in right now better than that statement I mean you could come up with a lot of statements but the way out is through really sums up the great storm what we're moving through and the mutation that's going to take place you can't just step around the stuff we're going through discovery through sharing abstract and experiential processes as opposed to strictly logical patterns so things like psychotherapy comedy and tragedy deeply experiential things and moving through processes and you know in psychotherapy say for example with the 64 47 channel between the head and the ajna that channel you could think of as a psychotherapeutic channel it has to move through a process before it comes to an, an, a revelation of uh, its own conceptions of things that it f the, the mind thinks about things that it's been through. And all this processing is kind of a way to relieve pressure that's coming out of the head center. And the pressure that comes out of the 64 especially might feel like quite a burden um, because it is abstract it might feel like there's a lot there that's difficult to hold on to or to grasp or make sense of. The abstract circuit also has to do with the emotions and feeling. Learning from history, its ups and downs, making sense of things after they happen, and deep reflection, etc. Deep, deep reflections in your personal life, but also deep reflection of things that have happened to other people's lives say in biographies, all biographies that have ever been written, say for example if you look at the 1156 channel between the ajna and the throat, this is an expression of the process, an expression of making sense of the past, right? The pirate archetype being what? Scars, eye patches, wooden legs, the engrossing story of what happened. Also buried treasure, world wonders, secrets being revealed. It's a bottomless treasure chest that the abstract circuitry can take you through. There, it's never ending. You're never going to find the bottom. And you're never going to find quote-unquote truth in the way that logic understands truth, right? Because it's the logical understanding circuit. This is the abstract sensing circuit. And we'll get deeper into how this works later. It has to do with journeys, adventures, and explorations, uh, be, having a kind of come what may. You have to push forward, and you have to have experience. It is the, remember, it is the need for experience. It also encompasses faith in a universal intelligence. Throwing bones, shuffling cards, tossing coins, or uh, throwing runes, trusting in chance. And now there is an intelligence within that. I can't tell you how many times I've had amazing... Uh, almost impossible readings with, with tarot cards where uh, it tells me things that are just way, way too, you know, th there is a, a force at work that we can't be 100% aware of in the left-oriented sense. There, are, there is a kind of awareness 
in the right oriented sense or in, in the non-dominant hemisphere of the brain or a non-dominant hemisphere of our own being that does not dominate and doesn't seek to dominate but that does influence and that can influence a lot of things peripherally now you could read a book like uh, uh, Anthony Peake's The Daemon to understand further what this kind of consciousness is and, and what it has to do with that's also very much connected to right orientation and because again it has to do with what happens after you die and what's death? Death is coming to the end of a process and then making sense of it after the fact which is very abstract oriented but the thing is you, you shouldn't have to die in order to experience this very open peripheral awareness and connect to your higher spiritual being um, or your deeper more profound spiritual being or however whatever words you want to put on this your authentic being prayer religion ritual and spirituality and at its core I feel is humanity it is a very human sphere and this is where the mutation is going to take place the other two awareness centers of the spleen and the ajna are pretty much fully aware it's the solar plexus that is not aware yet it's becoming aware so we have these three awareness centers with the solar plexus that's not fully aware yet now remember that the collective circuit group does not touch the heart center the heart center corresponding to will uh, resourcefulness but when you look at the individual and tribal circuit group they do touch the heart there is a resourcefulness within these two circuit groups that can touch on the power of the heart center to draw resources from to draw uh, information from in order to connect to the deeper reality now I'm not saying there isn't the collective doesn't I'm not saying the collective doesn't have its place it's not bad it's not wrong but it, there, there's a different reality when you're looking at individuals that touch source in a way that the collective does not so we have the collective circuit group and it's centered around leftness and rightness if you look at the body graph itself it is there is a kind of pulling to the left of logical circuitry and a pulling of everything to the right with abstract circuitry now depending on which centers are being connected you're going to experience this logic or abstract in different modes in different ways but in just looking at how these two circuits are centered around the spleen and the solar plexus we can find different keynotes for these for example in looking at the spleen we have a keynote of science which is left and logical you could think of left brain but there's also left beingness we have left brain which is very logical and language oriented and very compartmentalized and looking at bits of data and categories but we also have left beingness which is the spleen which is, has to do with our separated self our immune system the fact that you can hurt yourself in this world we do live in a world where there is separateness between people and you know the basis of science has to do with looking at things in particular looking at particles now there is a bit of an obsession of looking at particles and trying to find the God particle and things like that like what CERN is doing because we are deeply entrenched in a left oriented way that is now running itself aground which is a process you do not want to stop this needs to go to its utter limit in order for it to be the catalyst for mutation so this left orientedness has to do with pieces patterns is very physical oriented and is very future oriented logical circuitry is in a way saying we are many there are many pieces and many patterns in the world there are many tiny bits there are many categories right there are many words that we use there are many ways of talking about things when we move to the right with the solar plexus it has a keynote of religion so we have these two things science and religion future and past now it's interesting that the word religion means to bind back that's a fascinating thing we are binding back to source 
which is what religion really should be, binding back to source, but, you know, through the act of revelation, which is another key aspect of the solar plexus, when different prophets, seers, people have had revelations, it's everyone around them that takes those revelations and codifies them into dogma. Now, this is the problem that religion has. There's problems that science has, but there's also problems that religion has had. They're not binding back to source. They're not going back to source. They're still making everything very left-oriented in ways of codifying and making things very strict and categorical and very disciplinary, in a sense. So, religion is right. It's abstract which has to do with things like the holistic. It is experiential, emotional, and past-oriented. And you could say that abstract circuitry says we are one. Now, which is true here? Is it we are many, or is it we are one? Well, you could say they're both true, and you could say neither are true. They're both true in their own ways at the same time. There is a reality of unity and oneness, but there's also a reality of separateness and individuation. And we're going to look at how to balance these two things. There's a reason both of these sub-circuits do not touch the heart center. Because there is no ultimate truth in just one or the other. They both work together in order to help us commune with the other and make sense of the world that we're in. In the book of the law that was dictated to Crowley over three days by a voice in the same way human design was dictated to Ra by a voice, which took eight days, but in the book of the law, in chapter 1, verse 27, we read, Then the priest answered and said unto the queen of space, kissing her lovely brows, and the dew of her light, bathing his whole body in his sweet-smelling perfume of sweat. O oh, knew it, continuous one of heaven, let it be ever thus, that men speak not of thee as one, but as none. And let them speak not of thee at all, since thou art continuous. Now this is a way of looking at rightness in the way people use the word one. Because, you know, like a lot of spiritual people use the word oneness all the time. But the word one connotes something that has edges around it. Something that you can point at. Something that is a thing. But it's none of those things. It's not something that has edges around it. It's not something that you will ever be able to point at, and it's not something that is a thing. It is no thing. It's nothing. When you look at leftness, that does have to do with things in particular, pieces, parts, categories, things that you can pick up and examine. But when you're looking at rightness and the peripheral nature, it's nothing that you can point at in that logical sense. Now, this is something that a lot of logical-oriented people are trying to do but are always going to fail and I think it's an artifact of the fact that we've been living in a very left-oriented world that is leading people to misinterpret the word one in a spiritual sense or at least they're not um, they're not expanding their thoughts on it as much as they could okay this oneness that they're speaking of does not have edges it's not something you can point at it's not even something that you can discuss in a logical way. We also read in the book of the law in chapter 1, verse 52, If this be not aright, if ye confound the space marks, saying, They are one, or saying, They are many, if the ritual be not ever unto me, then expect the direful judgments of Ra Hor Kuit. Now what she's saying here is that if you get sucked into either the left or the right, if you're saying that it's all just one or that, no, it's all many, then you will be judged by the new energies of the age that we're in right now. It's, it's neither of those. It's nothing. It's no thing. And this is going to be really important the further we move along here. And this is also really important in the Letters from 500 books. Abolitionist Lysander Spooner writes, A government that can at pleasure accuse, shoot, and hang men as traitors for the one general offense of refusing to surrender themselves and their property 
undeservedly to its arbitrary will, can practice any and all special and particular oppressions it pleases. This is the definition of tyranny. Again, like I said with collective circuitry, it's arbitrary will. There are people out there who, when they use words like we, the people, we have a will of the people. We are only doing the will of the people here. We are serving the people. There is no the people. There Again, the word the is the definite article. It's when you're talking about a thing, usually. And when you're talking about people as things, especially the people as a thing, again, that's nothing you can point at. You can't point at it. It's nothing that can be looked at in that logical sense but we live in such a left strategic world and you know people crawling over each other's backs to reach these pinnacles of hierarchy in this extremely separated sense uh have used the force of their own will to rule over what they're calling the people the collective to put in place to put within the collective an arbitrary will, and have it's actually brainwashed people to think that there is some kind of will out there that they have or that they're doing. We see it today with voting. The Sanders Spooner has also written, A man's natural rights are his own against the whole world, and any infringement on them is equally a crime, whether committed by one man or by millions whether committed by one man calling himself a robber, or by any other name indicating his true character, or by millions calling themselves a government. Another quote from the Book of the Law in chapter 2, verse 25, reads, Ye are against the people, O my chosen. Now the second chapter of the Book of the Law has to do with the centeredness, the masculine nature of the itness of things, but which is also, again, paradoxically, something that can't be pointed at. It's not a thing in particular. There are certain things surrounding this that I get to in different videos. But a comment Crowley himself has written about this line in the Book of the Law reads, We are against, quote, the people. Any unit, any true star, is kingly, but the people as a multitude, even though each unit be noble, are not themselves. They are a confused mass of chance atoms. They must not be allowed to act as if they possessed a point of view. They are not stars. They have no way of their own. They are dragged helpless in the wake of any force that happens to attract them. To permit them to control events at all is to give up all design, all will, all clear sight. In chapter 2, verse 49 of the Book of the Law, it reads, I am unique and conqueror. I am not of the slaves that perish. Be they damned and dead. Amen. Herbert Spencer, another abolitionist, writes, The ultimate result of shielding men from the effects of folly is to fill the world with fools. Now this is another collective thing that certain governments do, and they use the a facade of wanting to take care of people in order to gain more control over people. If something bad happens, uh, then they want to punish all people in the name of caring so much. They care so much. Now, this has also led to the phenomenon of false flags. False flags have been used in the ancient past, probably, but up until our current time, they are getting more and more frequent and also more and more absurd. Another quote from the Book of the Law. Let it be that state of manyhood, bound in loathing. So with thy all thou hast no right but to do thy will. Do that, and no other shall say nay. Do thy will. Remember, the heart center. The center of will. Do what thou wilt. For pure will, unassuaged of purpose. Delivered from the lust of result is every way perfect. Crowley wrote of this line in the Book of the Law. 
Purpose takes the edge off pure will, for it implies conscious thought, which should not replace what nature intends. Remember, the ajna is not connected to the life. Work is done best when the mind does not know of it, either to urge or check its course. The lust of result also spoils work. One must not distract one's forces from their task by thoughts of the profit of success. So, the left logic and the right abstract has to do with questioning with reason and experiencing revelation. Leftness is about the question, which is where we get the word quest. Like you're going to go on a quest, you're going to go out and find something. The question, that is the act of seeking finding, going out in the world, right, and meeting many different forces. Things in particular, you could say, that's all very left-oriented. Right orientation has to do with experiencing revelation. Revelation that can only take place in a right-oriented way, when it can't, it can't be reached in a, a planned-out manner. It can't. You can create conditions that create very high probabilities of revelation. And that's another very right-oriented kind of quantum thing as well. High probability. What probability is awakening to occur if you set up these conditions and those kinds of conditions? Though, we're, we're moving into a time now where it's not about individuals having enlightenment and other individuals not. We're moving into a time where everybody, everybody is going to be moving through this bottleneck together. And just like it says in the book of the law, none shall be cast down or lifted up. All is ever as it was. Everyone is going to move through this. Now, interestingly enough, many gates of the spleen are in Libra, and many gates of the solar plexus are in Pisces. Of course, there are also some that are in Aquarius and Scorpio. But, you know, say, for example, when you look at the solar plexus, Pretty much all the gates of the solar plexus are within this area of the zodiac, being the 49, 30, the 55, the 37. The 63 shouldn't be in there. The 63 is actually in the head center. But, you know, the 22, the 36. And with the spleen, all the gates of the spleen are right here, within Libra and the beginning of Scorpio, being the 18, 48, the 57, 32, the 50, the 28, and the 44. Now, this is really important. Libra and leftness is connected to justice, balance, the scales, lady justice, all that, right? It has to do with things in particular. And when you think of the word particular, you think of particles. What is justice surrounded by here? Now, this is the Thoth deck that Crowley helped create. Justice, she's surrounded by particles, things in particular. She's weighing things. She's looking at the contrast between this and that. We live in a world of dualities where there is a separateness that needs to be acknowledged, which is why this ver it very much has to do with contracts and working with people and compromise. This is the card that's called justice or adjustment. It corresponds to Libra, which is Connected to the word Liber, which it means both book and freedom, interestingly enough. The words library and liberty. The Hebrew letter attributed to this card is Lamed, which means ox goad, meaning the goading forward, i.e. future oriented. The ox goad is a thing you poke an ox with to get them to move Forward, right? Goading forward, which means future-oriented. We're moving forward. And as I said, notice the particles or spheres within the card. There are 19 of them, corresponding to the 19th card of the major arcana, the sun, which has the letter Resh attributed to it, meaning head. Now, the sun is a very important aspect of leftness when you understand the story of Akhenaten, and aberrant sun worship that the world has been uh, stuck in for a while. Uh, 
with things like Christianity and, and, and the, cult, the Atonists. And even when you look at the symbol of Libra, what is it? It's a sun rising over a horizon. Say, for example, when you look at the Ace of Swords, you see the sun and the horizon in the background. But when we look at rightness with the solar plexus and Pisces, we have the moon card, the moon card that corresponds to Pisces. And when you think of Pisces, you could think of the Vesica Pisces being the feminine, the Yoni. And the Hebrew letter attributed to Pisces is Kof, meaning the ear or back of head, which again has to do with the subconscious and processing the past, i.e., experience and past oriented. So we're seeing a lot of fascinating connections here between astrology, tarot, Hebrew, and human design. Now, I know human design purists warn people against doing this, but these things need to be discussed. Now, notice the waves within the card. The wave is quote-unquote illogical and difficult to measure, being things like torsion fields, morphogenetic fields, orgone energy, etc., whereas the particle is very logical and relatively easy to measure and make predictions with, the wave is very difficult to measure and make predictions with. It's very hard to measure probabilities. The left has to do with weighing things out, making sound judgments based on facts, seeing contrast, being cool-headed and unemotional. It is on his own time. The left is on his own time. If we were to give it a gender, it would be a he. The right is mystical. It's blurry and foggy. It's wavy. It's a possible source of self-sabotage. It's also humanitarian, encompasses spiritual lessons, and is deep and emotional. Now, one thing you'll learn about the defined solar plexus is that people who have a defined solar plexus should wait and give themselves time to come to certain... Um, decisions in their life. Otherwise, they may do what? Sabotage themselves. They need to be very careful that they don't sabotage themselves. Now, this has been a meaning of Pisces and of the moon card, which corresponds to Pisces, for thousands of years. I mean, for a very long time. This is not something that's just like, you know, now this is something that's worth bringing up. That Pisces has to do with kind of like a misty, foggy nature that is difficult to see in, but that's what that's why it's connected to mysticism, being able to see through that and be able to peer in the dark, so to speak. It is going to become aware. The sun that is below the horizon of the moon card, that is rising up, as opposed to the sun that is already fully blazing in leftness. This incubating sun of rightness that deep within is coming out. It's, within, it's in a birthing process, and it's coming through that Vesica Pisces, the birth canal. Now, philosophically, you could think of rightness as being, in the Heideggerian sense, being with a capital B. And leftness as beings, with a small b. And we have left orientation and right orientation on the body graph. Left orientation encompasses labeling and naming the world around us, categorizing and man managing all pieces and parts of our world, focusing on one thing at a time. Now, that's very much what law has to do with when, you have, when you're entering evidence and things like this. What's, what is it about law? You know, you shouldn't be duplicitous. You shouldn't be talking about different things at the same time. You have to look at one thing at a time which is a very good thing about law and justice, if, if only our courts were actually adhering to these principles. Left orientation also has to do with organizing human relations, sharing and enforcing logical patterns, but we've seen that enforcing those logical patterns leads to a, a, a serious issue. Scientific objectivity and also hyper-rationality. There's nothing wrong with scientific objectivity, but there is a problem with hyper-rationality in the same way there is a problem with enforcing logical patterns, which we see a lot of in the world, even with scientism. 
forcing things in our food that we don't want, but that they think is good for us. They're enforcing their own hyper-rationality and what they think are logical patterns that are really just insane. It also has to do with viewing human beings as objects. Now, you might think that that's a bad thing. Seeing human beings as objects is bad. But we live in a world that is so left-oriented that we've kind of had to do that. You have to distinguish things, which has a lot to do with our labeling and naming. There's issues around labeling and naming things. Every person has a name. Every person has an address. Every person has a social security number. They might as well put a barcode on our forehead, you know. Uh, that's the kind of world we've lived in for a long time. Everybody has to have their station, their place, um, their so their rung on the social ladder. They're you know in the British Empire where the sun never sets, they are very status conscious there. Uh, even all the neighborhoods are so different that you know there, there is a kind of consciousness of where you are in the social ladder of things, depending on which neighborhood you come from and how different your accent is. You can almost notice the change of accents from different neighborhoods that are just a few blocks away from each other. Everything is so separated there, right? It's a very intellectual area. It's a very left-oriented area. And a lot of great things have come out of that, but also a lot of issues have come out of that as well. Now, right orientation has to do with experiences that are difficult to measure with science or explain with words. It encompasses all that's outside realms of the known. A peripheral and multi-simultaneous absorbing of the environment. Multi-simultaneous meaning not one thing at a time, but many things all at once, right? It's a, it's, it has to do with a lot of heavy processing. It encompasses the sharing of emotional or mystical experiences, initiations into new ways of being, religious or spiritual subjectivity, viewing human beings in relation to and as embodiments of being, with a capital B. You could say we all share the same being, even though you can't point your finger at this being, this being. Now, our relation to being is manipulated by our language, by words, and by the compulsive labeling, rationalizing, and atomizing of our existence into cold, anonymous, manageable pieces. One stuck in this realm believes that moving forward entails more labeling, more words, more legalities, more laws, more compromise, more government, and of course, more technology for all new bookkeeping in order to bring more altruism and the greatest good for the greatest number. But to better understand and come into alignment with our historical dot sign being our relation to being, exposing the trappings of dry and formal language and textbook logic, not the original logos in its relation to being, along with dismantling the chronic labeling, numbering, and filing of our existence, is necessary to reveal original thought, original thinking, and the original relation to being. So it's a deconstruction process of seeing what our relation is to being, being the original, the original being. And again, when you look at the solar plexus, what does it have to do with? A connection to a deep past. Now, religion has touched on that deep past, but this past goes right back to the very beginning, if there, isn't, if there even is a beginning. Now, what is that, that beginning? Source. What is that source? You are that source. Your deepest being goes to that source. All this surface level stuff with all these beings and the name that you have, the labels that you're given, the address that you live at, your, your social security number, the barcode that's stamped on the back of your head, that is not your deepest, truest, original being. The left logical side is not encompassing the true logos of our relation to that being, even though it should. So when we look at the left in its beings with a small b, we could also look at the being, just the being, the individual. That's also a small b. And what does this being do? How does this being move through the world? 
Well, you could say that he's an investigator. He's always looking at things and looking into the world around him as if he is separate from it in order to get clues about it and to slowly move forward through a, a certain process. And rightness is something that's like a monster, almost. Now, there's a fascinating correlation here with, say, uh, Lovecraft novels or any kind of uh, uh, whodunit mystery novels or detective stories. But I like the Lovecraft example because it's really il illustrative here. They, they always have two elements, the protagonist and the ultimate reality that the protagonist is going to discover and either be in, completely in shock of or discover his true roots through the process and discover he was maybe a different being of a different race. Maybe discover that he has... Uh, a connection to the cosmos and a, and a fantasy world that isn't quite as much of a fantasy as he thought it was. And this corresponds very much to the human relationship to the world in terms of the small b being, being the person who's investigating the world and looking at everything as if it, he is separate from it. He's looking at the physical world and following clues. But this rightness encompasses something that is going to come through revelation. And that's why we have a fear of the unknown. But the unknown is very much connected to source. It's something that should be embraced, ultimately, to embrace the unknown and to embrace paradox. That's why I like Lovecraft's novels so much, because the protagonist always, through all his searching and all his inquiry, comes to a place of revelation where he realizes certain things that defy logic and all this. And he might even realize that he's one of them, that he's one of these monsters, quote unquote, and that it's actually not as bad as he thought it was. It's not anything he thought it was going to be. Now, in looking at the structure of the hexagram itself, if you want to know more about the relationship of the lines within the hexagram, I recommend watching the video I did on the basic structure of the hexagram, which I'll put a link down there too. But... There are certain things to be aware of in the structure of the hexagram, which has to do with the binaries. These binaries are more connected to the tonal level, which is two steps below the line. Now, this is going to encompass a lot of things I'm going to be talking about in the future. We have the 1 and the 2, which is a splenic binary, the 3 and the 4, which is the Ajna binary, and the 5 and the 6, which is the solar plexus binary. Now, this is mostly connected to the tonal level. When you look at tone, which is two steps below the line, everything is arranged in a triangle. You have the first and second tone being the splenic binary, the third and fourth tone being the Ajna binary, and the fifth and sixth tone being the solar plexus binary. But even when we're looking at the level of the line, we have these keynotes of the investigator, which is this investigator that's always looking into things and looking at things. And moving up, we have these keynotes of the hermit, the second, martyr with the third, opportunist with the fourth, heretic with the fifth, and the role model with the sixth. But on the tonal level, these keynotes are smell, taste, being for the splenic binary, Outer vision and inner vision, being with the Ajna binary, and feeling and touch with the solar plexus binary. The first three are fixed to the left, and the second three are fixed to the right. Now, in looking at this triangle, there is a line right down the middle of it. And you could say that the investigator, the hermit, and the martyr on the level of the line are more left-oriented whereas the opportunist, the heretic, and the role model are more right-oriented. Now, what is the investigator looking at? What is the person who has a first, second, or third tone, or even a first, second, and third color or line, what are they focused on? Things in particular. They're focused on the world as it is interpreted through our leftness. You could say through our logical-based experience of things. At the level of tone, 
beneath the line, you have like the body graph before the body graph. You have what Ra called the ghost of the body graph, where it's just this simple triangle of awareness centers. The simple triangle of the three binaries, the splenic binary, the ajna binary, and the solar plexus binary. Now within this very simple structure, we have the nature of the body graph already laid out for us. That isn't full of the complexities of the surface yet, but it very much encompasses the pure nature of leftness and rightness and the, the frequencies that move through it. So, the left has to do with looking, seeking, finding, and looking at things in particular, being concerned with physical reality, and naming and labeling things, recording things. Whereas rightness is much more peripheral. Rightness has to do with revelation, uh, coming to find things after a process, coming to find things that you didn't know what they were possibly going to be with all your, with all your logical processes and trying to uh, project into the future. The unknown is a very sacred thing that we should embrace, not run away from. And in our process of evolution, up from leftness to rightness, we are at the pinnacle of leftness right now with the third tone being what? Outer vision. The fourth tone is inner vision. The third tone is outer vision. And we are in a world right now where we are labeling our butts off. And we are categorizing our butts off. And this is very much what human design has to do with as well. That's why human design was given to Ra. And why he was given the title of Uruhu, meaning door closer. Now, this also encompasses quantum physics, which you may have intuited when we're looking at particles and waves. We have the particles and the particulars of leftness and the waves and the probabilities of rightness. There's a video I want to show you that helps explain what I'm talking about here. So, what they taught us in school isn't really the way it is. And that our senses are playing tricks on us. You just gotta wonder, what is this reality that we find ourselves in? Quantum physics says it's all just waves of information. Do I believe that? <laughs> I hope so. Yikes! And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So when we throw things, that is matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. 
What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. Physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. It was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Now that's a great video, and it illustrates exactly what I'm talking about here. We have things in particular, and then we have no thing in particular. We have the narrowness of leftness and the openness of rightness. Um, and when you look at things like variable in, in human design, which again has to do with the, this tonal level of things being the splenic binary, the ashna binary, and the solar plexus binary, you either have a left cognition or a right cognition. You either take things in one thing at a time and are very strategic with your awareness, or you're very peripheral and take in information on many, many different levels. And you have a very high capacity for processing it's just, it's, it's a little difficult when you want to go in there and like the investigator with the magnifying glass, try to find the thing in particular, you know, especially with your determination, your design sun earth. If that has a right orientation, but you've been trained in our world to go into your brain and treat everything as a thing in particular with your memories and thoughts and with subjects, uh, to have intense focus on one thing in particular that can actually hurt your brain and uh, it's actually not honoring your true cognition which should be more open and peripheral so you can see how, how much of an issue it is living in a left oriented world where everything including people is dealt with as a, a piece of data a, a something that's identified uh, something that is a thing right something that has a name, something that's been labeled, something that is observed. Because when you are observed, what does it do? When you have that much labeling placed on you and you, you have the eye in the sky, quote unquote, looking on you all the time, it collapses the wave function. It collapses probabilities of freedom, probabilities of living in a different way, probabilities of moving into a new universe. But the thing is, the left-oriented world we live in is actually losing its grip.
and we are moving more and more into the unknown all the time. This has to do with a great rise in synchronicities, a great rise in healing modalities, a resurgence of things like shamanism and other spiritual practices. We are heightening different probabilities of our future. But certain, you could say, lords of leftness are wanting to keep us away from that, which is why they're getting us to focus. They're trying to get us to focus on different things that they want us to focus on that collapses the wave function. They want us to think the world is inherently cruel and scary and bad, and they're unleashing all kinds of chaos uh, in order to try and keep you interpreting the world in only a certain kind of way and that will collapse the wave function of higher probabilities of freedom of different realities of moving into a different future they want to keep you only on a certain timeline so leftness has to do with the observer its particles and its focused the rightness has to do with the no thing in particular its waves and its peripheral. The right orientation has to do with things that bend time, things that bend space, things that bend logic, things that defy reason, and things that are not easily defined. Which is great. Hooray for science and hooray for exploration. This means, this is a great thing for science because it means that it's a bottomless treasure chest. You're never going to find the end. You're never going to find the God particle like they're trying to do at CERN. You're never going to find the fundamental uh, particle of matter, of all matter. You're, it's it's going to be a never-ending process of discovery that's just going to keep going and going and going, and which is good. I don't ever want to find the end. I want it, I want my existence in this universe to be an infinite unfoldment of potentials and potential evolving into different states more refined states, different uh, discoveries about how the universe works, and different timelines and different races of beings and all, all kinds of things in our universe that I'm glad we have the ability to discover because everything is always changing and shifting through cycles, which is what the five and six solar plexus binary has to do with, cycles. Now, you could also think of beings and being in terms of beings of the being. Or you could look at it the other way around and think of, think of it in terms of the being of beings. So we have beings of the being, and we have the being of beings. Like, they go together. And in the Letters from 500 books, this is dealt with in terms of form and formlessness. The form of the left and the formlessness of the right, the duality and contrast of the left, and the no-thing and the union, or what you could call oneness, of the right. And you can't have one without the other. Just like I was talking about with the circuitry of logical and abstract, they can't be independent of each other. Even though people who are split in their thinking are trying to... They're, they're at war with themselves, but we live in a world where... People think there's going to be one or another, but there needs to be balance between the two. Because no, no one way has a will of its own. They're both balanced by something, and we're going to come into, we're going to come to know that something, which is no thing, very soon. So, another way to look at leftness and rightness, symbolically, is with the sword, and the vesica Pisces. The sword, you could say, is the divider, the dividing agent that cuts between things. It's a symbol of the this and the that. But it isn't always bad. Within the Letters from 500 series, again, this is dealt with in terms of being vigilant against all that is false and being able to deduce truth and to hold truth above all else within your small b being. And all this is very much connected to our use of language and our use of words, how we label things, okay? The sword has to do with words, right? Words equals swords. Words are, words are cutting. Words can be used as weapons. Words have a separating 
quality. When you label things, you kind of separate it from other things. You've categorized it. But that's not always a bad thing. It's not like we want to stop naming things completely. It helps us in making sense of the world. The sword also has to do with the sword of truth. You can see that uh, Lady Justice is actually holding this sword in the Justice card. The sword of truth. But outer vision cannot see into itself, which is why justice is blind. The outer vision of the third tone cannot turn that vision into itself and still be outer-oriented. It's blind to itself, which is why when you move into peripheral vision with rightness in the fourth tone, you, get, you can't look at things in particular anymore. You're not, no longer looking at things in particular. You're taking all information in, and there's a lot of processing that takes place in the fourth tone, and with the uh, 47th and the 11th hexagrams that are in the actual Ajna center on the level of the body graph. And this shows us the arrogance of an all-seeing eye, the sheer arrogance of the idea that there is some kind of all-seeing eye that sees all. No, it can't see all. It only sees things in particular, and it can label those things. And in its high pinnacle on top of the pyramid or whatever, it might have such an abuse of power that it thinks it can see all things in particular, like when it tries to collect everybody's names and put them uh, in a supercomputer in the desert somewhere where everybody's, all your activity is being saved and stored. This is a last-ditch Hail Mary attempt to collapse the wave function, to collapse probabilities of a different reality coming into view. But they're not going to be able to collapse it even though they're desperately trying to, this, this left-oriented consciousness. But when we move to right orientation... We have the vesica Pisces, which is not an eye, but a yoni, a birth canal. The part of you that is always being birthed. And you could say that it is bornless. The part of you that's never born, but is always being birthed. It's never ending. You are never categorized as a thing in particular. You're always and infinitely evolving into higher and higher states. But these are just words again, words. When I say words like higher, you're going to be like, what, what, what like we, can't, we don't evolve lower too? Like there's a lot of paradox that we need to chew on and you need to get used to the idea of paradox and of certain words that we use to try and describe things kind of collapsing and falling apart in the, in the face of paradox, which is actually a really good thing. I love paradox for that reason. It's, it has a dismantling quality. Again, the yoni is source. It is a representation of source. And what's fascinating when you start getting into tone in human design is that the fifth tone is very much connected to this dividing line, this dividing line between leftness and rightness, which is why the fifth tone has to do with sound. Especially when you look at things like the fifth color, and also the fifth line, there is a lot of vibration and frequency going on with them. So the fifth, the five has to do with sound, frequency, and information. Now, in the beginning was the word being vibration and frequency, not the letter, which is reflection and representation. The letter is leftness, right? It's a label. But the word is the vibration and the frequency. And that's what came in the beginning, which is, again, right-oriented. When you look at the body graph level, the source or the original, what came first, which is all really paradoxical to think about again, because if there was a first, then is there a before that? No. It's, it's something to really think about in terms of where's the beginning and where's the end in all this. Well, th th that's part of the illusion that we're in. So in being in the left-oriented world that we're in, where we are the little being who's trying to investigate the big being with a capital B, we should not be afraid of the unknown. We shouldn't uh, feel like we're the martyr of the third line. And Ra even said this. He's like, the only reason a martyr is a martyr is because we live in a world that is very dysfunctional. 
So people who have a third line in their profile feel like a martyr because they're, they're up against very high probabilities of things happening to it because it's right bumped up against uh, rightness. It's trying to see things in particular, but the unknown can always happen to it because it's so close to rightness as well. So it, through its nature, it will feel like a martyr, but it doesn't always have to feel like that. It's just that we live in quite a dysfunctional world. But even in, in the terms of the investigator and the hermit, the hermit shouldn't always have to feel like a hermit, to always be closed off to the world because the world is so dysfunctional. Uh, but we shouldn't be afraid of exploration. Remember what I said? The way out is through. And in moving into this realm, like in the Lovecraftian sense, we want to find that really deep being that we're so afraid of. That thing that we think is so scary out there, but that is actually uh, a wonderful exploration and a wonderful journey and a wonderful adventure that we can go on to discover things about ourselves that we never knew. Things within the deep, like the Lovecraftian being Cthulhu, who lives at the bottom of the ocean, who sleeps and dreams and sends out his thoughts to all of humanity drawing them closer and closer to his abode and closer and closer to their quote-unquote doom. Well, yeah, it is doom. In Letters from 500, the human race is doomed. But that's not a bad thing. We're just going to mutate and become something completely different. So, yes, there is doom <laughs> ahead to a certain part of us. There's a great quote from the Lovecraft story, The Nameless City, which goes... That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons even death may die. Remember what I said about death? That death has to do with coming to the end of a process and being able to have hindsight and look back and understand that process after having gone through it. It's the ultimate point of revelation. But we're moving into a time now where, you know, with strange, we're in strange aeons. We are in a time where even death may die, where you don't have to actually physically die to experience this, to experience a wider reality or to open up your vision. And that is not dead, which can eternally lie. Because when we think of leftness with, you know, the spleen and the physical body, the spleen very much has to do with the physical body, physical things, particles, the ring of matter, the codon ring of matter is entirely within the the spleen. And the root of the ring of matter is the 57th hexagram, uh, which is really fascinating. But the thing is, when our experience of physicalness, we feel like that when this body dies, that we die with it. But that's not true. That is not dead, which can eternal lie. And with strange aeons, even death may die. This is a foreshadowing of our own evolution that Lovecraft was probably uh, writing about, but maybe he didn't consciously know that that's what he was writing about. He was just very much obsessed with these themes of the investigator, the protagonist, the detective, the eye, right? The single eye, trying to collapse the wave function so to speak, in a sense, and trying to find the truth. What is the truth? But the truth is too much for him, his little mind to contain. The ultimate truth is too much for his little ego, his little self, to contain. So this is just a quick look at collective circuitry and its kind of fractal nature when looking down to the level of tone and leftness and rightness and how we can better understand leftness and rightness. So we're going to look at a little study chart here. And it is Steve Jobs, actually. Now this body graph actually tells us a whole lot about Steve Jobs. He had a 6'3 profile. You can see with his personality and design Sun Earth that his personality Sun Earth are within the sixth line of those hexagrams. And his design sun earths are within the third line of those hexagrams. And we can see that he has the 1762 channel, which is between the ajna and the throat. This is a channel of far-sightedness and precision. 
It's part of the understanding and logical circuit, hence it's very linear and concerned with the future. This channel is heavily concerned with details as well. As the saying goes, the devil is in the details. It is adept at seeing patterns and communicating those patterns, along with what patterns work best. Alpha programming is part of logical circuitry. The 713 channel is the alpha channel and is reflected in one way or another throughout the entire circuit. Now, you might have heard stories of Steve Jobs where he would he was so obsessed with things being perfect. He like held the vision for people. Now, this is a very kind of visionary uh, channel as well. And people might complain about Steve Jobs and, and say, oh, he, he really didn't know that much about technology. He really didn't do that much. But what he did do is he held the vision, which was a very intense and concentrated vision, which we see with the 952 channel between the root and the sacral. The 952 channel is called the channel of concentration. This channel possesses great determination and focus and exercises restraint and stillness in order to stay with one thing at a time. It is the very root, called format energy, of logical circuitry within the body graph and exerts a powerful influence on every channel and gate within that circuit. So right here we have the very root of logical circuitry. Now format energies are really fascinating. We have three format channels. The 4253 which is the format of abstract circuitry, the 360 which is the format of individual circuitry, and the 952 which is the format of logical circuitry. These three format energies are very powerful and exert a large influence on all other channels within the respective circuitry. And Steve Jobs has what? The 952, which is the format of logic. But it's funny that even though Steve Jobs has these two powerful logical channels, especially with the 952, what else does he have? He has an abstract channel, this 4130 channel of recognition. It's the only abstract sensing channel Steve had, and it greatly fueled his desire to move forward with his dreams of what could be. The 41st gate is one of anticipation and fantasy, and the 30th gate is one of desire, pulling one toward new experiences. From the definitive book of HD, quote, This pressure may launch some pretty wild rides, generally involving others, but can also stimulate deep reflection for all participants after adventure is complete. Now, does this describe Steve Jobs to the letter or what? Especially when, again, like I said in the beginning of this video, you have to take all these things together. Because if Steve Jobs had the 4130, but with certain other channels, it might not be the same story. It might not really be the same story. And that he has a 6-3 profile, this profile is at the very end of all the profiles before we go back to a 1-3, which is the beginning, back to right angle. So the fact that he has a left angle 6-3 profile and the, the very last of the profiles, this profile is looking forward always. That sixth line personality is very visionary. It's always looking forward. I'll... I'll Again, you can go back and look at my basic structure of the hexagram video to see how the sixth line operates and the keynotes of the sixth line. It is very visionary. It's looking forward always to the, the next foundation, the new thing. Now, it's funny that when Steve Jobs lost Microsoft, what did he do? He created this uh, new company, this new computer called Next, right? And even when he was with Microsoft the first time, why did he get fired? The company was hemorrhaging money, but he kept wanting to push forward with these incredible, intense desires to have a new experience, to keep pushing forward, pushing forward. It didn't matter that they were losing millions of dollars. He was just being generally kind of irresponsible. And that's that's really fascinating that, you know, how he just has this thing within him to have to experience new things with the 4130, this desire and this anticipation of new experiences. And he has all these collective channels uh, being that one abstract channel and these two logical channels, meaning involving quite a bit of other people's uh, energy. But 
it takes all kinds to bake a cake. You've heard that saying, like, that's the message of Steve Jobs. He could help orchestrate a few things, but it's not Steve Jobs being a dictator, like running into the manufacturing department, telling those people how to do their job, and then running into this other par- department and telling those people exactly how to do their job. I mean, he, he could have had issues with things like that, maybe at some times, but it was always all about every person doing their particular job, what they're good at, and doing it the best, right? He can't run in there because he's not the will of the people. That doesn't even exist. Everybody has to do what they're good at and then pass on something to the next group of people. And then they work on what they're good at and then they pass that on to another group of people and then they then work on that and uh, expand upon what's given to them. So you could see when we take all this together with the 6.3 profile, the 17.62 channel, the 952 channel and the 4130 channel we get a really good picture of who Steve Jobs was and we're not even looking at all the complexities elsewhere in the body graph yet which we could look at there's a lot of things here to look at when you want to explore centers and what it means to have an undefined center versus a defined center and what that's all about so moving forward this is collective circuitry but we're now going to be looking at individual circuitry, which is really fun. I love individual circuitry, mainly because maybe maybe because I have individual channels myself. But the individual circuit group, you can see, has all these channels that are in between collective. They're in between everything. And it's kind of interesting that collective channels have a lot of energy going in between certain centers, like between the G center and the sacral. You have both the 15.5 and the 46.29. But with individuals, you have only the 214 channel. That means a lot is placed upon the individual to bring a certain kind of direction. It's not pulled to the left or pulled to the right. It's very individual and it's it has a certain dynamic that I'll be getting into here shortly. Now the individual circuit group has to do with empowerment, mutation, individualism. It is oriented to the pulse of the present moment. Again, not future oriented like logic and not past oriented like abstract passion and creativity, but also melancholy and embracing aloneness, finding one's own path. This can at times seem very difficult when all collective ladders, so to speak, are pulled up and you realize no one is going to save you in those times of melancholy. The key is to train the mind to stop obsessing over reasons. There are no reasons. It's pure chemistry. You can even enjoy it. Now, there's a difference between chronic depression and states of melancholy or awkwardness. Melancholy and awkwardness is sort of natural for individual channels, feeling out of place because they're not hooked into a collective movement. They're very much attuned to the moment. But if you do have severe issues with depression, there are might there's a lot of things you could do with either your diet and other uh, therapies that could help with that. But I have noticed that people that have uh, very strong individual circuitry going on in their body graph, they can suffer from bouts of uh, depression and melancholy. And there is, a, there is a lot you can do attitudinally to pull yourself out of that. Or to move through those states more gracefully and not making them worse than they are. Another thing individual circuitry encapsulates is the Lucifer archetype which has to do with beauty and rebellion. One of the things about individual circuitry is that it's either on or off. It's either creative and passionate or melancholic and embracing aloneness. Now just because you embrace aloneness doesn't mean you're always melancholy. There could be a sense of melancholy, but it's always a balance between these two things. And the imbalanced expression of this is seen in manic depression. 
as manic depressives have a very difficult time moving through this on-off chemistry of individual circuitry. Um, when they're when they're on, they want to keep it on forever and just kind of burn out, you know, forever. But if that were true, everybody with a lot of individual circuitry would probably die by the time they were 18. Um, there's a reason that it's on and it's off. There's a reason you burn a lot of energy, that creative energy. And there's a reason you go into hibernation mode and go back into your shell. It's just that when people go back into their shell, they feel empty. That Promethean fire isn't there anymore, and they start to wonder where it went. Is there something wrong with me? Why am I at the mercy of the elements like this? We'll get into why this is. And this very much has to do with, quote-unquote, out of darkness cometh light, and also out of light cometh darkness. These cycles, again. Now, within the individual circuit group, there are two sub-circuits. The major circuit of the knowing and the minor circuit of centering. The knowing circuit has to do with being empowered as a self and empowering others as an example of individual uniqueness. Knowing is unpredictable and comes and goes like the melancholic and creative cycles. The mutative qualities of the knowing circuit may be under heavy scrutiny and criticism from the collective and the tribe, making it imperative for the individual to be able to explain themselves. The knowing circuit is particularly vulnerable and many times alone whilst going through different processes and knowing cycles. And there's difficulty in identifying with certain collectives and tribes. During the unpredictable on phase, Something new and strikingly unique can appear to be afoot. Just as quickly, though, this can and will fade, leading to yet another melancholic stage. Just as the individual can bring light to a social setting, for example, he or she can just as easily suck light away from it when their creative fire seems absent for some reason. It's very much like a quote-unquote black hole of sorts. One cannot force the unpredictable creative force itself into existence, and attempting to do so only transforms the already existing melancholy and awkwardness into a highly frenetic and particularly disturbing form of melancholy and awkwardness, leading many times to depression. Now, the centering circuit, which has only two channels, has to do with empowering independence, and self-reliance that's based on a true understanding of uncompromising self-love. The self is initiated into progressively deeper and deeper levels of authentic being, and then initiating others. You have the channel of initiation, which is the 2551 channel, but also the 1034 channel, which very much centers the self. It really has to do with... Uh, exploring your own self very, very deeply and coming to be within your own behavioral self in a way that can sometimes exclude others, but it, when it's operating correctly, it could very much be an inspiration to others to want to explore further. The centering circuit has to do with surviving the forces, staying centered during the shocks of initiation. It is concerned with the mysticism and paradoxes of universal selfhood. Loving and honoring the self first before social conventions and conditioning. Maintaining correct convictions for the individual and focusing on them in such a way that brings great self-mastery. A kind of mastery that may empower even those with very strong tribal definitions where the community is put first in terms of love and service. So the centering circuit can greatly inspire people who maybe don't even identify very much with individual circuitry. It can very much take their awareness and center it into self-mastery. The individual's ideal world where being a unique and authentic self isn't met with resistance from others. This is a big deal, especially for the 1034. Now again, 
when we look at the centering circuit, it's a really fascinating thing pops out at us. It is not connected to any of the three awareness centers. All the other circuit groups are connected to an awareness center, but this sub-circuit, the centering circuit, is not. And there's a reason for this when we again look at the Book of the Law. Chapter 1, verse 44. For pure will, unassuaged of purpose, delivered from the lust of result, is every way perfect. See? The will of the heart center, and it's pure will. It's, it's not lusting for anything. It's not aware of itself. It's just perfect. It's perfect will. Some people have called the 1034 channel the Buddha channel of just being a self. It's just pure being. And the majesty of that pure being, of being in itself, it doesn't have an agenda, so to speak. It's just pure being. It's also important that when looking at individual circuitry, we should also look at the integration channel. Now, the integration channel has four channels in it that do not encompass the knowing circuit or the centering circuit. It seems a little complicated, but it's easy the more you get familiar with this. The four integration channels are the 1020 channel, the 1057 channel, the 3420 channel, and the 5734 channel. And again, the 1034 is part of the centering circuit, and the 5720 is part of the knowing circuit. So, integration channels have to do with self-empowerment and self-preservation. This is a kind of self-empowerment that isn't shared, you could say, isn't shared as much as either the knowing circuit or even the centering circuit. The integration channels are the backbone of the body graph and of individual circuitry, having to do with defense and survival. Again, very left-oriented since it's all, all these integration channels are coming right out of the spleen, which is very much concerned with the immune system, separateness, things in particular. You are an individual, right? When you think of integration, you could think of integrity. Think of the integrity of your spine. If this integrity is compromised, the individual will feel very melancholic if his or her back is bending and breaking in monotonous patterns not of its own making, i.e. being hopelessly lodged within the mechanics and timing of collective circuitry with seemingly little hope of escape. Now, interestingly enough, Ra had a lot of these integration channels, and that's exactly what he felt before he had his experience. It's partly what led him to need to get away from his old life is that the world around him was crushing him. He, he felt like his inner being was being compromised in many, many different ways by the world around him, just the monotony of everything. And, you know, another example is compulsory sardine can state schools that look and feel more like prisons with each passing year. They don't honor the individual. From the definitive book of human design by Linda Bennell and Ra Uruhu, quote, the natural primal reflexes built into integration assure us that we can trust the life that lies within us when it is empowered by response, gate 34, guided by intuition, gate 57, directed by correct behavior, gate 10, and manifested in the now, gate 20. Integration is also connected to the immune system of the individual. The body may reject a transplant unless a person takes immunosuppressive pills. You can literally see the body rejecting foreign body parts if it is something like an arm, for example. The same applies psychologically and spiritually. Ideas and behavioral codes within cults and cultures can become like viruses looking to replicate and root themselves within an individual system. People with integration circuitry very much feel these ideas. And they, they do feel like viruses. Not to mention being monotonously stuck in processes in the physical world that they might feel really out of, t out of tune with. For those with individual circuitry and integration channels, foreign ideas and concepts that are given with great certainty but that go against personal conviction are met with great resistance. 
even for individuals with no individual channels, they may still have a very strong sense of self. The self is the most defensive thing we know of, and self-preservation goes far beyond the physical. Even ideas that are given with great certainty can feel like someone pointing a finger in your, into your chest, especially if the word you is being used often and there is a sense of being interrogated about your ideas and what you think. Those without a strong sense of self may fall prey to cults and the status quo more easily as their immune systems have been compromised and virus-like ideas have replicated themselves within them. This is why occultists generally stick apart and why, when they come together, there is usually a lot of infighting and tension that erupts out of nowhere. This has to do with the fact that occultists are usually very strong individuals with very strong individual immune systems. They don't need other people constantly telling them what's what. They rely primarily on themselves, which is exactly how they got to where they are in their understanding of things. So we have the individual circuit groups, and these the individual circuit groups are connected to the heart center, which has to do with will, which leads to questions of free will. Do we have free will? Well, yes. The will is so free, in fact, that the mind cannot grab hold of it. Remember that the centering circuit is not touching an awareness center. The will, pure will, tears out of the individual in ways the mind cannot control or concoct ultimate reasons for. The problem of reason is the same as the problem of causation, the constant asking of why. Another quote from the Book of the Law in chapter 2, verse 27 through 31 reads, There is great danger in me, for who doth not understand these runes shall make a great miss. He shall fall down into the pit called the cause, and there he shall perish with the dogs of reason. Now a curse upon Bacause and his kin. May Bacause be accursed forever. If Will stops and cries why, invoking Bacause, then Will stops and does not. If Power asks why, then is Power weakness. Many people are familiar with the saying, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now this very much connects to individual circuitry, and we're going to really get into this right here. We have the first and the second hexagrams. The second hexagram is all yin feminine lines, and it's made up of two trigrams of earth, the earth trigram on the bottom and the earth trigram on top. The first hexagram is made up of all yang masculine lines, and is made up of two heaven trigrams, a heaven trigram on bottom and a heaven trigram on top. These two hexagrams are within the G center, which is the individual you could say, center of the body graph it has to do with individual direction and also collective direction when looking at the collective channels of the G-Center. But this collective direction is still radiating from the individual, the center of self. You could say the G-Center is a center of self-reference, you could say. So it's interesting to note that not only are the first and second hexagrams within the center of self, they are part of two individual channels in the center of self. The first hexagram stretching to the throat, the expressive, and the second hexagram stretching to the sacral, the life force. Now, the G center is the identity center of the body graph. The primary coding within it, with the first and second hexagrams being primary yang and primary yin, provide a template that is reflected throughout individual circuitry. In the sense of the shadow, this template has to do with the melancholic sense of dislocation inherent in individual circuitry. On the gift level, this template is an archetype of the great creativity and synchronistic orientation of the present moment. At the highest level, this encoding is about the beauty of uniqueness while simultaneously being in union with the whole, i.e. heaven and earth commingling. Now these keynotes of the shadow gift and the highest level being the city is something you can find in the gene keys knowledge which I use very much in looking at the different kinds of awareness that moves through the body graph. Now something to realize about the second hexagram is that it is called the magnetic monopole 
It is the feminine polarity that holds everything together in union. And you could think of the on-off nature of individual circuitry in terms of these hexagrams as well, with the feminine yin hexagram being off and the masculine yang hexagram being on. And they both balance each other. It's not that one is bad and one is good, nothing like that. They both need each other to bring singular expression. Now, just as the mind can obsess over the melancholic phase, making it worse than it needs to be, the mind can also obsess over the creative and passionate phase, making it too frenetic. This imbalance always occurs when the mind obsesses on one state over the other, and is what actually leads to bipolar and manic depressive issues. It can. It's a, it's a part of it, I've found. There could be other issues with diet and history and traumas and things like this, but individual circuitry, I found, does play a part. In a desperate move to stave off the coming melancholy, the mind thinks it must up its activity, as if this will cure the coming downtime. But all it does is make it much worse when it does arrive, perpetuating the cycle of abnormally high highs and desperately low lows. It's always darkest before the dawn concerning the creative melancholic cycles that the individual goes through. When it is very dark feeling, there is about to be a significant creative burst. It is very important to not try and cover up that inexplicably empty feeling with lots of distracting, loud, and busy activity. There is a dawn, and it is coming. One simply can't force it to come any quicker than it already is. Individuals get depressed as the social and collective mask falls more often for them than others, and the more mentally preoccupied one is with the maintenance of the social mask, what's expected of them, etc., the more difficult and deep the depression will be. Now, as I said in the beginning, the only shape that the first and second hexagrams can make, the only three-dimensional shape they can make, is the star tetrahedron, which is the basic geometry of cell division after conception, which is really fascinating. We have the sperm and the egg. We have that which seeks and that which is still and waiting and passive. And again, all 64 hexagrams of the I Ching put together create the 64 tetrahedron grid, which is what the basic geometry of the flower of life symbol is. Anybody that's familiar with the symbol of the flower of life. Now, we're going to be looking at tarot again to help us explain a few things. The moon card, which is the 18th card of the major arcana, which again is connected to Pisces, has to do with the seed and the egg coming together or mingling in the same place. The waves of this card, interestingly enough, have to do with the potentialities of what could be when you have these two things coming together. You can see a mixture of the sperm and the blood within this card, which is why we have red waves and white waves. And you can also see the shape of a chalice. The Sun card, which is one card after the Moon, which is the 19th card of the Major Arcana, has to do with fertilization, the actual connecting, and the giving the birth of new life, and the growth, and the innocence, and the, the shining forth, and the moving forward of new life. Whereas, you know, Pisces and the Moon has to do with potentialities and possibilities. Remember from the Quantum video? There's lots of potentialities and possibilities and probabilities. None of them have necessarily happened yet. They might be happening on the quantum level. But the way things happen on our level, you know, there's a lot of things that could happen. In the same way, you know, in the same way that Pisces and the moon card can have to do with disease and miscarriages and things like this. There can, things can go wrong. But the sun card immediately following it is that bursting forth of life, is the bursting forth of a new reality, the new reality that is finally actually stepped into, that awareness has fully come into. The moon and the sun also have to do with the two eyes of Horus, the left eye of Horus and the right eye of Horus. And this is further connected to the Kiro symbol, the Greek Kiro which is where we get our Rx symbol from. 
and which is further connected to the skull and crossbones symbol, which is interesting because when people think of the skull and crossbones, they think of death and poison, when in actuality that symbol come, is, is a symbol of life and, and rejuvenation, ultimate rejuvenation. And you can read more about this on uh, the moon and the sun and the alpha and omega of soul development at terotica.net slash Neptune. On my Neptune page, I really get into all this symbolism here and how this is connected very, very deeply to balancing light and dark, masculine and feminine, uh, left and right, winter and spring, and this crossover between entropy and centropy. And this is very, very connected to individual circuitry if you want to get further into that. Now, there is this thing in human design about the mutation that's supposed to take place in the 3955 channel. And this mutation has to do with the individual coming into a wider spiritual reality. Now, this is very much what these two eyes of Horus have to do with. And this, the Greek Kiro and the RX being a symbol of health and revitalization and rejuvenation of the individual that's constantly rebirthing himself into a new experience every moment, being in the moment. That's very much what this mutation has to do with in the, in the 3955. The mutation that's going to take place in the 55th hexagram in the solar plexus. And the triggering of that through the 39th hexagram in the root center. Now remember that the left seeks and is active. The right receives and is passive. The individual is born of a mixture of both the left and the right. And is aligned to the present moment. But this is also what makes individual circuitry more aligned with the spleen through the integration channels being the backbone or the quote-unquote immune system of the individual. The left-oriented spleen has a digital moment-by-moment -moment awareness that is concerned with surviving into the future, and the individual circuit is also attuned to the on-off pulse of the present moment and is concerned with self-preservation. Both the spleen and the individual are active and seeking forces. It is the more communal and right-oriented solar plexus that receives the individual. This is why the mutation of the 55th hexagram is so important as it will bring great balance to the two ways of leftness and rightness. A perfect balance of these two ways within the individual creates the warrior spirit, or a warrior of truth, a kind of being unto death where one truly lets go with trust into the receptive and quote-unquote unfocused experiential omni-awareness of total rightness. Now there's two people I want to talk about in terms of this leftness moving into rightness. <clears throat> and these two people are UG Krishnamurti and even Alexander. Now they both had this experience very different, but also very similar. UG Krishnamurti had an experience where he was seeking his whole life, seeking, seeking for uh, enlightenment, for an enlightened experience, for awakening. He was doing so much yoga. He read so much philosophy and uh, was just seeking and seeking, but eventually collapsed from exhaustion, from asking the question, right? He collapsed from exhaustion, from seeking the question and let go into complete what you could call omni-awareness of everything and his mind stopped labeling things and this is a, a fascinating thing when you read about Krishnamurti is that he could look at a clock and the word clock wouldn't even enter his head he could look at things in particular and he wouldn't be experiencing any labels about what those things are what he would be experiencing though is wonder and amusement and amazement at things because he didn't have this imposing leftness with its patterns and its labels training his mind training his mind to only look at things in a specific way and it's kind of funny that all these labels just kind of fell away from him it, but the experience itself he felt like it almost killed him when he finally collapsed from exhaustion of asking the question Eben Alexander, the same thing sort of happened to him when he had his near-death experience. When he was in his near-death experience and he was on the other side in, in what he calls the ultra-reality, 
He didn't know his name. He didn't know his life as Ibn Alexander. He didn't even know where he came from. He had no reference point in terms of labels, in terms of the life that he had been living. He was in a completely different place, but he was pure awareness without labels. So in life, you could say that people are always looking out, right? Looking out and seeking in terms of this left-oriented way. And when you experience the world constantly like that, and it's constantly reinforced through things like schooling and the news and government and politics, how we're supposed to experience the world, outer vision, the outer vision of the third town, and also the splenic reality, uh, the splenic binary of me, not me, this, that. You know, we see it on the level of tone, but it's also on the level of the body graph. We structure our entire experience of the world in this way. But that's also why I really like the Lovecraft stories, because it takes people who are really oriented in that sense, the people who are asking too many questions, right? Well, be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. Rightness has to do with omnidirectional awareness. That is a 360 degree awareness that is not looking at any one thing in particular. It is taking in everything. And what's interesting about it is that when you get into pure rightness, the individual itself doesn't even exist. You're just pure awareness. You're not labeling yourself. You don't even look at yourself as just a person with a name, with a certain history. All information is coming into you from many, many different angles. And the restrictions of labels and the restrictions of being just an individual start to fall away. And you could say that this is the dissolving of the ego and the limitations of the ego. That's why this state is so terrifying to the ego. And that's why the protagonists in Lovecraft stories experience horror and terror, right? When they come up against the unknown. The unknown is terrifying to our left-oriented ego, splenic awareness, that is so concerned with boundaries and borders and defining ourselves in only a certain kind of way. We don't want to dissolve into the allness. We don't want to dissolve into nothing. But we don't know what kind of awareness really awaits us when we do that. And you might be reminded again of this picture. Questioning with reason and experiencing revelation. This is what happened to UG Krishnamurti. He kept questioning, questioning, questioning the hunchback, right? The hunchback, that is the investigator bent over looking at things in particular. That's why the question mark looks like that. It's bent over looking at things. It's looking down. It's with its magnifying glass and its microscopes and its labeling and its obsession with things. But the experience of revelation pulls one completely out of that because you can't use reason to come to ultimate revelation. It has nothing to do with logically plotting it out. It's going to happen regardless. But again, you might do things that heighten certain probabilities of things taking place. But again, with the kind of rightness that we're moving into, it is a very universal kind of global thing. It is not focused on just one individual who knows more, did more, that kind of stuff. It's not about that. It's This kind of revelation is much, much bigger. Now, another person we could look at is Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley the man. But the thing is, he had omni-awareness. Which Crowley are you talking about? He went through a lot of work to try and destroy his own ego, even though you could say he was an egomaniac. If you read the book uh, The Eye in the Triangle by Israel Regardi, Crowley had a lot of his own issues, but he was also a genius in his own right because he could master many different things without pouring his ego into any one of those things. And even if he did pour parts of his ego into those things, it was all about not being obsessed with the lust of result. Because the more you get obsessed with the results of what you're doing, that disconnects you from the work at hand. It disconnects you from what you're actually doing. 
And a tarot card you could say Crowley identified with quite a bit was the Five of Wands, having to do with thy will be done, the fifth line of the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. The great work and the will and do what thou wilt. It, ha it doesn't have to do with identifying yourself as just one thing or a thing in particular. This will has, it is omnidirectional and can move into many different kinds of things. It's just that, you know, being in the left-oriented world that we're in, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of overarching social constraints and belief systems that are even in an individual's own head that they might grapple with and wrestle with. This is, was very much the case with Crowley growing up in a very, very strict Christian household and experiencing beatings and, and extreme hypocrisy from his elders and, and things like this. This led, in part, to a lot of his rebellion against that. So again, when we look at tone, we have the splenic binary of the one and the two, the ajna binary of the three and the four, and the solar plexus binary of the five and the six. Now remember that this dividing line between leftness and rightness has to do with sound and frequency and vibration. That's what holds everything together. But it's also the basis of mutation. Remember that individual circuitry is in the middle of all these centers. It, all, it connects the center of all these centers. And it's really simple. It's not like, say, between the G center and the sacral, it isn't the 515 and the 4629. It's very simple and concentrated within the 214. And it is the basis of mutation. The way mutation takes place is that there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, and then there's a spike. Then there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, then there's a spike. Then there's another plateau. Now, this is partly why uh, individuals experience this on-off dynamic of either being in a creative spike or being in the plateau where there's no nothing happening because they're so attuned to this present moment that they're not in necessarily conscious control over when they're going to experience a little mutation. It could, it could be a little mutation. It could be a big mutation. But humanity as a whole is about to experience the big mutation. Individuals ride the razor's edge between logic and abstract, between sound and silence, between mutative spikes and plateaus of seeming stagnation that are really only places of deep integration. When you come back down into a plateau from a spike, a lot of integration takes place in order to move forward. Now, it's interesting that Ra himself had a completely undefined sacral, giving him a unique perspective from the outside looking in. He was very sensitive to sacral sounds, as he called them, and tried to incorporate this overt sensitivity into his behavioral prescription for those with defined sacrals. But the reality of sacral sounds is more involved than simple uh-huh and uh-uh responses. Sacral response can come in many, many different shapes and sizes. Now, the sacral really does have to do very much with this division between leftness and rightness, and the sound and frequency and vibration, and the source of the sound, frequency, and vibration, which we'll be looking at later. Now, in looking at the feminine and masculine hexagrams, you could think of the yin hexagram as the potential for life and the vesica pisces, the probabilities. The masculine hexagram, the yang, being life itself or the sun. And then going to an experience of death with the vesica pisces again, experiencing the allness. Now remember that I said you don't have to actually literally experience death. You can bring death to you. When you come into this actual life, you could experience things the other way around. When you come into life itself, you can experience life and then experience little deaths within that life where you surrender yourself to a greater whole, a greater wholeness or a greater oneness.
And Crowley himself had this saying, die daily. There was also the Sufi saying, die before you die. Meaning, let go before you're forced to let go. Let go before the physical body forces you to let go. And it's often been said that people don't die until they choose to die. And that's, it, it is a great choice. And you can actually bring this choice to you in the present moment. I'm not saying I'm a master at it. I'm saying it's something that has existed in mystical practices for a very, very long time. So this is individual circuitry, and let's look at a study chart. This is Frank Zappa. And the further we move along here, you're going to see exactly why Frank Zappa was the way he was and why he was able to produce so much music and all that. It's, it's really fascinating. He had a 2-4 profile, and which will tie in later, definitely. And he had the 4323 channel between the ajna and the throat, this individual channel. Now the 4323 channel of structuring, or what Ra called the genius to freak, is an individual mutative channel between the throat expression and the ajna mental conception. As such, this channel represents highly individual and unique expressions of mental concepts and ideas. As an individual channel, this mutative and unique awareness inspires others and can very much influence the direction of their creative mental expression. You also have the 731 channel, which is the, called the channel of the alpha. It is a logical channel between the G center, which is identity and direction, and the throat, which is again expression. Logical circuitry is future, mastery, and pattern oriented. So this channel is particularly suited for leadership, being that it influences others through example by expressing the best patterns for whatever enterprise the leader is showing the way into. One is either on board in the pack or not, and no concessions are made to those who are not. He also had the 5710 channel of perfected form between the G-Center and the spleen. Gate 10 in the G-Center carries the creative, mutative, and unique behaviors of the individual. Gate 57 in the spleen carries an acute sensitivity to the acoustic world of sound and vibration in the immediate environment, leading to a spontaneous and highly intuitive awareness of one's surroundings. A, quote, selfish channel of perfecting personal expression, of creating what you love and loving what you create. He also had the 3457 channel of power. The intuitive 57th hexagram in the spleen connected to the 34th hexagram of power and response in the sacral. Intuitive response to the environment is this channel's core meaning. There is great vitality in simply being a self that is deeply grounded and acutely aware of each passing moment. This channel represents the archetypal individual concerned with its own survival, well-being, power, and tranquility in responding intuitively. The last channel he has is the 3410 channel of exploration, which is part of the centering circuit. The 34th hexagram of power supplying energy to the 10th hexagram of personal behavior. The love of self is too strong for the individual with this channel to compromise its deep convictions, behaviors, and, quote, how it does things. Though it can very much influence the behaviors of others in terms of coaxing out their natural gifts and loving who they already are, even those with strong tribal and collective circuitry may be empowered by the 3410's lifelong process of self-exploration and personal perfection. Although this need to explore new territory may rub off and inspire those who are in the vicinity of it, challenges may arise in group situations as the uncompromising individual must always stay true to him or herself. Now here's a video that will perfectly explain the way Frank Zappa went about everything, how much energy he had for work, how it is that he pumped out over 60 albums, 
during his lifetime, which could have been a hundred albums had he lived longer because of due to how much uh, material he had on the back burners and in the in the archives. Um, and it also goes to explain things like the, you know, the 731 channel of, of being a, a leader in an alpha, but also being kind of militaristic in how you run things. So sit back and enjoy this short little movie about how Frank Zappa did things. Well, it's not just that drugs kill you. It's that they, when you take them, they turn you into a type of person that I don't like to hang around with. I mean, people just, their personalities mutate. Their value systems change. And generally, uh, this is not a hard and fast rule all over the world, but it has been my observation that when Americans consume drugs, they are instantly transformed from regular normal human beings into raging assholes. And uh, I just don't like to be around them. The band rule is that you don't use drugs when you're on the road. What you do at home, that's your business. Yeah, it was just businessmen on a business trip. You had to, like, be really, really respectful. And to have the... Uh, just, we had to be respectful people, yes. He didn't use drugs. He didn't uh, take advantage of anything. You know what I mean? I mean, his songs, sometimes they... Like, say, the song Cocaine Decisions. A lot of people listen to that song and they just hear the word cocaine and they think it's about cocaine. It's about everything that happens to you if you do that shit. You know, Frank liked to have fun, but he didn't like to break the law. Chop a line now. The thing about Frank is he was always writing. You'd be on the plane, he was writing. At the coffee shop, at the, the hotel, he was writing. On the way in the limo to a gig, he was writing. Backstage, he was writing. He'd be having a cup of coffee somewhere, and he's writing. I mean, always working out the details of his art. This is the, the highest form of compulsion I have ever observed in my life. I, I marveled at how he could keep up. You know what I mean? He would, he'd be up like 36, 40 hours and still pumping, you know? And, you know, like he'd say, go home and get... I remember when we were recording Shake Your Booty. It was down here in Santa Monica at the Village Recorders. And he says, I want you back here in five hours. I said, Frank, we've been working for almost 40 hours, man. I need eight hours sleep. Says, You'll be back here in four hours. So it takes me an hour to drive from here to Los Feliz, where I'm living, in an hour back, which meant I would have two hours of sleep. I just went to the beach. I laid, I got something to eat. I laid down on the sand. I wake up from the sand and I'm saying, oh my God, I'm completely sunburned. And I went back to the studio and I was itching and scratched. I got rest, but I mean, he was right. He stayed. He didn't go back home. He just stayed. He'd be up two, three days sometimes, man. My relaxation is my work. I don't make any distinction. I enjoy what I'm doing. I like what I do. I just keep doing it until I fall asleep. I'm going in you again. He was a very private man. There's no doubt in my mind that he wanted to keep part of him very dark and very personal and very insulated. I'll never forget one time when we were in Florida uh, after, I think it was the 78 tour. We were coming back from England. And we had a week off in, in Key Biscayne, and we were staying right at, on the beach, and we had a week off. And it was, it was a hard tour that we had just come off of, and then we had to start an American tour. So we were all taking it easy. And one morning, I was walking on the beach, and... I see Frank in a pair of cutoffs. I had never seen him with shorts on in my life. And he was coming, I think he was wading in the ocean. And he came out and he saw me and turned his head away and ran into his cabana. <laughs> but I, I think he was embarrassed because I saw him like get a little close to nature, you know. But it was, I had never seen Frank in a pair of shorts before. And it was so strange seeing him like at the ocean. Usually you see Frank. I look at Frank and I see him either on stage or I see him in his throne in the control booth of his studio. You know, he, I don't think of him in terms of, like, outside. You know, he was such a, a science man. Now, that's really interesting. He was a science man, right? He has a very well-defined spleen. 
He's got this uh, logical circuitry of the 731, which is collective and pulling people along with him. It's an alpha channel, meaning he has the pattern. He's showing the way forward, and you're either part of that pattern or you're not. Now, some people, ex-band members, thought that he was a little too too militaristic. It was it was really, really difficult working with him. But the thing is, if you had the chops and you had the ability, it was very, very rewarding. Um, he said that, you know, being in his band is only second to being in the Marines, really. And when you look at that militaristic 731 channel, that channel of the Alpha leading the way forward, you know, we get a lot of information as to why he was the way he was. Also with the 4323, that channel that can just take dog dirt. Ra said people could take uh, dog dirt and turn it into gold, this channel, which is really fascinating because that's what he was doing. When he, he would find people and kind of coax out talents that they didn't know they had. Um, they're like George Duke, for example. He he always tells the story. He always told the story. George Duke, he, he died recently, but he always told the story about how Frank got him to play the keys differently. He would always uh, try to coax him into either singing or playing different kinds of music on the piano or the keyboard or using a synthesizer, but George was always against it. But Frank kept pushing him and pushing him and, and leaving things on uh, his uh, his piano and on his keyboards like, hey, I'm just going to leave the synthesizer here. Just mess with it whenever you want, whenever you can. But through this process of kind of breaking his barriers down, Frank really got George to express himself in ways that he didn't think was in him, you know, and Frank really got it out. You could say, you could say that he got it out through that that 3410 channel of empowering people to explore themselves and to explore different things that they may have going on, right? And Frank, he also had that 24 profile, the second line personality which is really uh private and kind of a uh, in a it's kind of hermetic, but he also has the fourth line unconscious, which is very social and very sociable and transpersonal. So, you know, you take this together, he was very good with people, but he was also very private at the same time. It's the same thing with these uh, individual channels that he has, with the 4323 channel and also the 1034 channel. But even the two integration channels that he has with the 1057 and the 3457, that's like really powerful stuff coming out of the spleen and out of the sacral and getting straight to his behavior in the G center, which is informing everything else in his body graph because he has what's called a single definition. All of these channels and all these centers are connected. There's no break they're all connected together. You can follow all the channels to each center and there is no uh, area that needs to be bridged. Say for example if he had the 4130 channel that Steve Jobs had then he would have what's called a split definition because these two definitions are not connected. They're, they're almost like they're two little islands of awareness. But other people could come into his aura and maybe bridge these centers through their own aura but when you have a single definition like Frank had, it's as if you're very self-contained. You don't need other people or certain other circumstances so much. Now, I'm not saying that if you have a split definition or a triple definition or even a quadruple definition that you need other people always. Um, you can be you know, self-contained in your own way. It's just that when you're a single definition, you are really, really self-contained. In moving forward, we're going to look at another individual, quite individual chart here. And this is Trent Reznor of the infamous band Nine Inch Nails. Now, the reason I'm choosing this is because it really encapsulates the melancholic and depressive elements that individual circuitry can have. You'll notice that he has a 3-5 profile and he has this 1-8 channel between the G center and the throat. It's the channel of inspiration. And the first hexagram in the G center is an archetype of the creativity inherent within all individual gates and channels. Hence it is also an archetype of the melancholy and potential depression in them as well. 
The basic on-off cycle of individual circuitry is found within the first hexagram. The eighth hexagram in the throat looks to contribute resources to the creative drive of the one, helping its vision become not just a small reality, but a large and expressive one. He also has the 214 channel of the beat. Being one of the three tantric channels between the sacral and G center, the 214 channel is highly sexual, though being an individual channel, it is particularly mutative, innovative, pulsating, and unusual in its creative role. Being true to its own direction and purpose, this channel empowers direction in others, usually without the individual purposely trying to do so. He has the 3740 channel of community. This channel is about deals and contracts, but these contracts are signed in blood, not ink. In other words, deep bonds to a tribe are needed for those carrying this channel. In return for being recognized, the 3740 builds a sacred space for the tribe to, quote, worship in. It is the tribe itself coming alive with a great functional spirit through the dedicated works of those with the 3740. And that's really uh, something to think about when you think about the fact that Trent has these individual channels of the, the 214 and the 18, but it's a split definition from the 4037. Now, this has caused a lot of issues in certain professional relationships, especially the climate of the times when he was trying to get his music released after uh, Pretty Hate Machine. He had record label people trying to uh, get him to change his art and to smooth things out because it was just too depressive and angry. And that's what led to a lot of frustration when he wrote the album Broken, which came after Pretty Hate Machine. It came out in like mm, 1991, I think. And that album is so angry that you wonder if he's singing about himself or if he's singing about actual relationships outside of himself. Well, the thing is, it's both. If you listen to a song like Last, that's a very, very intense song about some kind of relationship, and you wonder if it's all about him, how he's feeling on the inside, or if this, if this is an actual relationship with somebody he's having on the outside. The, the possible depressive nature of the 214 and the 18, feeling disconnected from certain tribal influences with the 4037, can lead to some difficult relationships. Uh, you know, these bonds that he makes with people have to be very strong. And if those bonds get broken, then he, it might feel like his heart is... Like in the beginning of the video for his song, Closer, you see this heart that's beating. And it, it's interesting because it's like... It's, there's really interesting symbolic stuff throughout all his music that really tells the story of his actual body graph. You know, say, for example, if we were to look at open centers, you look at the fact that he has a completely open spleen. Now, having a completely open spleen could have a lot to do with security issues and feeling like you might not have something to hold on to to help keep you secure. And that's a lot what a lot of his songs have to do with as well. Um, in certain of his videos you can see that he does this thing where it looks like he's shivering he feels like he's cold there, there's something there isn't something to hang on to lots of lyrical content that has to do with things slipping away things keep slipping away he can't hold on to certain kinds of security but he's always looking for more security now this is great creative expression like if you're going through an existential crisis like this and you have a creative outlet for it that's great to just get it out and to really explore this stuff. Plus, he has these highly creative channels, you know, those individual channels that help him harness this stuff and actually explore these states without um, them destroying him. I mean, I listened to a one interview he gave back in the 90s where it's like, this music really helped him. He, if he didn't have the ability to write music, he might not be alive. And another real interesting thing about Trent's chart here is that when you look at the name of his band that he came up with, Nine Inch Nails, he said he got that uh, from apparently how the nails used to crucify Jesus were nine inches long. And that's real funny because he has a third line personality, which is 
the martyr, always feeling like you're being crucified upon things, that you're not in control of certain outcomes and always having things, quote unquote, go wrong with one of the themes is bonds made and broken. Now, how do you think that would feel to someone who has this 4037 channel of community and is experiencing certain depressive elements with these two individual channels? And on top of that, there being a split definition between them. Those bonds made and broken is probably those that theme of bonds made and broken is probably really intense feeling. Probably too intense. Very powerful interpersonal relationships and you know and him exploring these themes of very deep relationships that then crumble and seem to slip away and and, and mutate where he very very deep stuff you know so some people it's obviously not their cup of tea it's really aggressive music uh exploring themes of depression and you know, like looking at an album like Downward Spiral, for goodness sake, like it's really a, a theme of going on a downward spiral. But there are really deep explorations of different emotional states and bonds between people, how those bonds can be broken. Um, really fascinating uh, stuff there. So that is individual circuitry. Now we're going to look at tribal circuitry. And tribal circuitry is made up of two circuits, the defense circuit, which is a minor circuit, and the ego circuit. And the keynotes of the tribal circuit group are support, also the bargain, meaning all parties give something, hence all parties receive something. The bargain may either be communal and right-oriented in nature, as with the 4037 channel, which is more emotional, spiritual, and familial exchanges, solid barters and deals, based on warmth and love and recognition and respect. Kind of a you scratch my back, I scratch yours thing. Or it could be capitalist and left-oriented in nature, as with the 4426 channel, where transactions are less emotional and spiritual, warm and familial, but more logical and focused on the physical improvement of the, quote, extended tribe, unquote. Quote, I'll sell you this great thing that I can tell you obviously need for a certain amount of money, which will help secure future production and improvement of said great thing. The three splenic tribal channels of the 4426, the 2750, and the 5432 are concerned with outward projection navigation, survival, and maturation of the tribe in the world on a utilitarian level. Whereas the three solar plexus tribal channels, being the 3740, the 596, and the 1949, are concerned more with inward belonging, recognition, and acceptance in the tribe, and the maintenance of the strong emotional and spiritual bonds that hold the tribe together. Now first we're going to look at the minor circuit of the tribal circuit group, which is the defense circuit. And this is very much concerned with reproduction, being the 59-6 channel of intimacy, and taking care of what is produced, the 2750 channel of preservation. So here we have generation and nurturing, the creation of life and the preservation of that life. The defense circuit acts as the cradle of the body graph, where the continuation and care for human life is assured. The creation and preservation theme of this circuit isn't always about human life, though that is the main function of it. It may also have to do with birthing new endeavors, 59.6, and ensuring their survival in the world, 27.50. On the human life side of things, once intimacy is generated out of the friction between people and a child is produced, one needs to ensure the survival of that child by providing education and instilling proper values, or even undermining and exposing dangerous values that make sure they never reach your child's value systems in the first place. So, just keep in mind, again, that the splenic reality is outer-oriented, the solar plexus reality is inner-oriented. We can see this on the tonal level as well. When you look at leftness and rightness uh, with the ajna, the kinds of vision we have, 
the third tone is outer vision, the fourth tone is inner vision, and the spleen is very much outer oriented, being in the world of things, and the solar plexus is inner world, where there is an all-inclusiveness, and it's also very spiritual as well, seeing the union between things, and sensing the union between things. In looking at the ego circuit, the ego circuit surrounds the defense circuit like a protective and nurturing shell that is concerned with supplying the material needs of the community, which is very important for the generative defense circuit to be able to draw from. In Richard Rudd's book, Circuitry, A Complete Guide to Circuits, Channels, and Gates, he writes, The role of the tribe is twofold, to transform personal ambition, 5432, into successful teamwork, 4426, that ensures continued protection and control, 2145, and to build balanced relationships, 1949, that support and nurture each person's place in the community, 4037. Now let me read that whole sentence without actually naming the channels. The role of the tribe is twofold, to transform personal ambition into successful teamwork that ensures continued protection and control, and to build balanced relationships that support and nurture each person's place in the community. That's the nature of the tribe right there. Since the spleen represents more of an individual and differentiated perspective within the body graph, owing to the integration channel and its harmony with the first and second lines, colors, and tones that are more personal and particular, etc., the 5432 and 4426 channels have more of an entrepreneurial drive, a striking out with an individual spirit while at the same time very much being able to work within a tribal context. The solar plexus is more inner-oriented in terms of belonging to a community and forging the emotional bonds and communal spirit that holds everything together. It isn't just about money. The currency is emotion. One might say that the difference between the splenic tribal channels and the solar plexus tribal channels is that the spleen deals in material resources, whereas the solar plexus deals in human resources. We see the same thing when we move from the lower trigram to the upper trigram in the hexagram structure, being a movement from material resource orientation, third line, to human resource orientation, fourth line. In the body graph itself, the tribal channels may be thought of as the mediators between left splenic awareness and right solar plexus awareness, much like the, quote, dividing line between the third and fourth lines of the hexagram. This is also leftness and rightness at the tonal level, but also representing the bridges connecting these two awareness centers, with the key bridge being the heart center. The heart center is the hub of tribal circuitry, as it balances both the left and the right, and also gives singular expression and manifestation to them in the throat center through the 2145 channel. The shadows of these two gates may display themselves as dominance, 45, and control, 21, though the gifts latent within this coding are synergy and proper expression of authority, respectively. Now, what's interesting about the defense circuit is that we see the spleen and the solar plexus come to a point in both the 50 and the 6. The 50 you could say is a concentrated aspect of splenic awareness. You could think of it either as a distillation of splenic awareness or even the source of splenic awareness, depending on how you want to look at things. It's the same thing with the six that at the point of the solar plexus that's pointed toward the sacral again. You could think of this as either the source of the wave principle or a distillation of the wave principle coming into manifestation. You could look at it either way, depending on how you want to talk about things. Now, the 50 and the 6 do represent certain core principles having to do with both leftness and rightness. Now, in looking at just the 50, we have core principles of the left, which you could say is a distilled, very distilled nature of logical circuitry, but it's not part of logical circuitry. It's part of tribal circuitry as is the 6th hexagram. But in just looking at the 50th hexagram, we see issues with the labeling and the naming and the separateness of so many things that 
is our world is built on. When we look at the 50th hexagram through the Gene Keys knowledge, we see that it has the shadow of corruption, the gift of equilibrium, and the city of harmony. Now, this has to do, the equilibrium has to do with the equilibrium between things, between this thing and that thing. And it's interesting that equilibrium, libri, comes from libra, or libre, which again is connected to justice and courts and things like the seventh house, contrast. You exist in this world with other beings. And in order for there to be equilibrium, we need to address certain real, very real issues of human beings living together in a world, out in the world. Again, the spleen having to do with living in the world. And I highly recommend going and seeing the movie Equilibrium. That's about a future where human emotion has been deemed a disease. And they've eradicated human emotion, which is really fascinating when you look at the body graph here and how things are split into leftness and rightness. They're creating these stories about a future that is imbalanced and unintegrated. What would an imbalanced and unintegrated future look like if things keep going as they are uh, with this very, very imbalanced leftness? And But there's issues in terms of labeling with leftness. Some people might be familiar with Thoth, who is the scribe of the gods for the Egyptians. And when we look in tarot, for example, at the magician card, we see a lot of things having to do with Thoth, which is very connected to the mind and record keeping. Uh, it's very connected to language and labeling and being able to see things properly. It is said that Thoth taught the Egyptians everything about magic and astrology and astronomy and the sciences and all this kind of thing. The same could very much be said of the archetype of the magician, which has... Hermes or Prometheus pictured on it, who took fire from the gods and gave it to man. It has to do with the fire in the minds of men, being able to use our intellect. And the number of the magician card is one, with its ruling planet being Mercury. Now, Mercury does rule certain mental signs like, you know, Gemini, and Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, which means it's it's always ahead of the game. It's always uh, it's always busy thinking, you could say, but it's also can be it also can be very deceptive, because with the ability to label comes the ability to deceive, with the ability to use language in the way that we do comes the ability to not only deceive others but to deeply deceive yourself, which is where the trickster element of the magician and all these trickster gods come from, like Hermes or Prometheus or Ishu. And Ra talked about this a lot in his Decoding the Lines of the Hexagram PDF when he's talking about the third tone, outer vision, which is why truth is so important. We also see the Ape of Thoth in this card. Now again, the 50th hexagram has to do with values, principles, precision in record, word, measurement, and science, education, books, and computers. When you think of the 50th hexagram, Shadow of Corruption, the way Richard Rudd described it in the Gene Keys, it's like how you can have corrupted files in a computer. You have all this information, but information can also be corrupted. You can also have a corrupt court, right? You could have duplicity in court. You could have uh, corruption in government, which is also a big part of the 50th hexagram, being a condensed, concentrated version of all things splenic. In wanting to take care of people. It is very tribal in that sense, but there's an issue in keeping an eye on people, right? The 50th hexagram also has to do with careful judgment. Now, everything I'm saying here is also very much connected to Thoth and Mercury, and the magician card, and all this very mental stuff, and, and using our minds. But the thing is, you have to be careful with how you use your mind. Careful judgment. Here we see a scene that's called the weighing of the heart after death. We see Anubis weighing the heart of the recently deceased against a feather to see if the heart is heavier than truth. 
because the feather is the feather of Mayat, who was justice for the Egyptians, Lady Justice for the Egyptians. And on the left side, we see Thoth keeping a record of everything taking place. Now, here's the issue with the 50th hexagram. You do not, or rather should not, or cannot abandon what you create. But there's a difference between not abandoning something and having a camera shoved up its backside following its every move and judging its every action, which is only a distorted third tone interpretation of this core principle that is beyond mind. Okay, This 50th hexagram is concentrated splenic aspects, but there are there's way too much going on in the left-oriented world in wanting to name, label things, keep tabs on everything, track everything. And right now we're just in a very exaggerated aspect of that in our, in our world. But the core principles of it are sound. There are sound core principles in what all of this has to do with. Like with precision in record, word, measurement, and science. There is nothing wrong with being precise. Like the precision of the 62nd hexagram in the throat of the 1762 channel. All of this is very important. It's being expressed in different ways, and when it's expressed through this tribal sense of the 50th hexagram of the human being coming coming into the game, like the actual how we're going to take care of the human being itself, there are certain issues with that when it comes to labeling. Now again, we're going to go back and look at this slide, and you can think of the third and the fourth tone as being left brain and right brain. I would recommend a book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian Jaynes. And I would also recommend a book called The Daemon by Anthony Peake that I already mentioned in the beginning. Now remember what I said about there being left beingness and right beingness. We do have left and right brain, but the principles of leftness and rightness go beyond just the mind. The mind is what we use to see. That's what's fascinating about the third and the fourth tone, having this division right down the middle of it. Uh, that allows us to see both the left and the right. But being at the pinnacle of leftness that we are with the third tone, we can see the arrogance of this quote-unquote all-seeing eye that sees with its outer vision, that sees the world, kind of the physical splenic world, that it's in and sees all these things and just like a computer thinks that it can be some kind of God over this mainframe. Now on the left we have beings and on the right we have the being which you could think of as the being. Now we could change this to things and no thing in particular. Leftness being concerned with things and rightness being concerned with no thing in particular. Experiences. And when we go back to here, what do we find? We find that we're very much looking at things in particular. It's very much concerned with things identified. Now what is the thing identified? The word resident comes from Latin. Resi meaning thing and ident meaning identified. So what is the thing identified? You are the thing identified. Now, there is an issue with this. I mean, with the way governments have treated Western governments especially, but also Eastern governments, and the way governments in general treat their people, quote-unquote their people, as things. They are a thing identified. Now, this can, all, this can be useful in, again, record-keeping, being precise in record-keeping. It can be useful um, in court situations, where careful judgments need to be made and all that kind of thing. But again, there is an issue in the oversaturation of our left-oriented world to label things. And people are so stuck on these labels and hung up on the surface level of things that they are not recognizing the deeper being within people. Everything is so on the surface that these labels are starting to fall apart and they're starting to cause us serious issues. But again, this is part of the great storm, and it's going to create a catalyst that leads us into a new awareness of the recognition of a deeper being. It's just that it needs to exhaust itself, and this whole process needs to play itself out. 
So we have the 50 in the spleen and the 6 in the solar plexus, which are concentrated aspects of each. But we also have the 27 and the 59 in the sacral. And this leads to the question, is it the leftness and the rightness coming in, pointed toward the sacral, that's generating our reality? Or is it the sacral radiating out that's generating leftness and rightness? Like I said earlier, which way is it? Well, you got to understand that it's the sacral. The sacral generates experience on this plane. It generates both the logical particle function and abstract wave function. With the 59.6 being inner-oriented, generating new life and potentiality, and the 50.27 being outer-oriented, taking care of that which is generated within the world, this in-out dynamic, of course, has a sexual connotation, which is why the sacral represents the generation of the life force itself. It is sexual in that it both radiates these functions away from it and attracts them to itself at the same time making the sacral aura open and enveloping. So you could say that it's both. You could say that it's pulling these principles toward itself and also radiating them out. And again, we see this on the tonal level with the sound, the sound of the fifth tone and how the fifth tone is connected to this dividing line between the leftness and the rightness. Now again, sacral sounds go beyond audible hearing as the generator of leftness and rightness embodies all frequencies and vibrations. It's the bridge between the left and the right, and also the creator of them. Now, we're going to look at another sample chart here, which is Jordan Maxwell. Now Jordan Maxwell is a, is a researcher who's been looking into many subjects for a long time, usually of a religious matter, but also government matters, occult matters. He's very fascinated by the occult and has uncovered many things for people. Some people have called him the grandfather of conspiracy research. And he's had many amazing experiences in his life, which could also be shown in his body graph here. Jordan Maxwell has a 4-6 profile. And the first channel we're going to look at is the 214 channel, the same channel that Trent Reznor had, which is the channel of the beat. Another name for this channel is the Keeper of Keys, meaning it holds keys to different directions energy can move in the world. It can greatly inspire direction in others by being the living example and being true to itself and its own process. People who come into contact with an aura that has this channel may feel that their direction in life is being affected. Jordan also has the 952 channel of concentration that Steve Jobs had. This channel is the root of all logical circuitry. It condenses awareness into a focused point of stillness, leading to great determination to stay with one thing at a time until a given task is completed satisfactorily. He has the 5818 channel of judgment between the spleen and the root. The shadows of this channel are dissatisfaction, 58, and judgment, 18. The gifts, though, are vitality and integrity, respectively. There can seem to be a fine line between the gift and the shadow, though within the patterns of the shadow, the gift actually lay hidden. What may seem like harsh judgments and appraisals are in fact the same patterns one finds in the care to end unnecessary suffering and for humanity to live joyfully upon the earth without interruption. He has the 2750, which we just talked about, the channel of preservation. One of the two channels that make up the defense circuit. Whereas the 596 is concerned with inner world production and protection of life, feminine reproduction, the 2750 is concerned with outer world preservation of that life. And whereas the 596 takes down boundaries between people, leading to sexual friction and the creation of new life, the 2750, in essence, creates boundaries in order to protect and guide that life in the world. This has to do with things like education, housing, clothing, etc., which are all physical splenic needs. But it also concerns values, 
which values to hold and which values to discard or even undermine in order to stop them from reaching and affecting the tribe. Now, this is very much a role that Jordan played. He was very concerned about the direction the world was moving in. And his cross is very fascinating when you look at his personality sun earth and his design sun earth. They actually form channels. With the 58, 52, and the 18, 17, you'll see that this cross has built into it a channel of the 1858 channel. Now this creates an interesting genetic continuity, I think. There are a few other crosses that have this about them that actually have a channel built into them. But you know, you look at Jordan's body graph and you see that he's also a single definition with the 952 channel that can really focus and he has focused his attention for so long and has read so much and is so educated in certain areas that it's just amazing the, the amount of work he has produced in this life. And yes, like the Keeper of Keys, the 214, he has given people so many keys to understanding in so many different subjects as well, whether it's law, whether it's government, whether it's the occult, whether it's theocracy and religion and all these kinds of things. He's really given people the ability to see certain forces at work. But again, like with the 5027 and the 1858 working together, it can. some people have complained that he might seem too harsh in his judgments. But you got to understand that there's reasons he's talking about things in a certain way. There's reasons why he seems harsh. And I'll just go ahead and play a short little video here that somebody made as a tribute to Jordan Maxwell and his lifelong work. So, enjoy. A lot of kind words have been said about me, but I want to clarify a few things. I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I never have been, I'm not now, nor will I ever be. I'm too smart for that. <laughs> you may be a wonderful person, you may be very sincere, you may have done wonderful things, you break the law, and what goes around, comes around. Consequently, it's all money. It's all manipulation and exploitation coming out of Phoenicia, Cana. It goes back to the old Sumerian Babylonian systems of words and terms and symbols and emblems that have been used to manipulate the whole human race. Because our masters don't give a damn about you or your family or, or your destiny with God. All they care about is what they have always cared about, and that's controlling the whole damn world. The church in America, unfortunately in the rest of the world, is organized crime. At its highest levels, it is high politics, major money. And anytime you've got major money and profound effect on that masses of people, you've got to know have organized crime. Help me. And this one teacher said that if you can tell some tell an audience something about God so that the whole audience can understand it, then that will prove conclusively that you don't know anything. Because any pea-sized, ignorant, ill-informed, unread brain like yours cannot represent the divine presence in the universe. We do not know the hand of God. I'm ashamed of this country and I'm ashamed of the people who call themselves Americans who drive around with a damn silly ass flag on their car and not even realize that's not an American flag. You can bet your bottom dollar that the religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education. The Knights Templars who set up your international banking cartels in the 12th, 13th, and 14th century are the same people that gave you educational institutions. And consequently, the world is filled with violence, bloodshed, or disorder. Good people are dying. There are children who are starving, our world is in trouble, and people are calling out to God for protection. 
People are calling out to God to help our nation and never realizing for one moment that the divine presence in the universe not listening. Why? Because you have your own concepts of whatever you think is true, whatever you believe to be true, but you have never confronted the real truth. California criminal justice system. Criminal justice, not American justice system, not the people's justice system. It is the California criminal justice system. You think that's by chance? Think about it. You think that the government makes mistakes? The only mistake is that you're thinking that they're making mistakes. These guys know what they're doing. When they say criminal justice, they know what they're talking about. The criminals are in charge of the justice. So consequently, when you go to church, just remember, it goes back to Mother Circe in Greece. <clears throat> Circe, if you go back to the library and get some books on Greek mythology, it will tell you that her name gives birth to what we call the church today. And Mother Circe was able to hypnotize people and bring them into her home, hypnotize them, and so that they would lose their mind and become animals, and then she would feed off of them, eat them, and feed off of them. That's Greek mythology, Mother Circe. So consequently, Mother Church has done just that. She has hypnotized people, brought people into her house, and uh, consequently lives off of them one of the most important uh, financial institutions in the world is the Roman Catholic Church and all the other churches like the Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists and Christadelphians and Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to catch up with. Um, when you see someone making a speech in that room, look on both sides of the podium. Don't look at the person talking. Look at the symbols. For many will look with their eyes, but not see, and will listen with their ears, but not hear, and with the heart, not get the sense of it. You need to open your eyes and look at the symbols on both sides of the podium, which is about an eight or nine foot high fasci, call a fasci, a bundle of sticks with a hatchet head, the symbol of oil, power, and Rome. I think it was Hiram Mann that said, when no man is safe, when freedom fails, the best men rot in filthy jails, while those who cry to appease, appease, are hung by those they tried to please. Meaning that there can never be uh, <clears throat> a common cause with darkness. There's no place in, for light dealing with darkness. You have to know the truth and seek the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's an old adage, but it's true. The more you educate yourself, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become, and you begin to see lies everywhere. And now you're in tune with God, and now you can begin to see where things have come from and where they're going. In a law dictionary, you talk about being human. You know, well, I have human rights, the Human Rights Commission. You know what the word human means in a law dictionary? Hue is a word for color. So you're a colored person. Hue, man. You look up the word hue, man, in a law dictionary. And it says, see monster. Law dictionary. Not Jordan Maxwell. See monster. Okay, you look up the word monster. A monster is a human being by birth, but in some parts resembling a lower animal. A monster, having no inheritable blood and cannot be an heir to any land. So much for being a human being. Do not take anything for granted. Mr. Parma, Mr. Manley Hall once quipped that uh, always trust a person looking for the truth. Don't ever trust the one who's found it. Because the universe is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. 
the Passover is simply the sun passing over the equator, coming back to the northern hemisphere to begin become the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when it passes over the equator on the Passover and the ancient Egyptian calendar was in the constellation of Virgo, so God's son is born of a virgin and he becomes king of kings and law of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Virgo is one of the constellations of spring. Wake up. The entire thing is astral theology. Thank you for watching.